Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rahma and I am going to be going through uh, a very quick and fast reading of some of the chapters of first aid. Uh, for me personally, one of the challenges of the study is getting through first aid and some of the chapters. And it can be a little bit daunting if you don't have someone to help you. So I used to use DIC videos to help me get through, but I started to realize some of them are not very high yield, so sometimes I just need someone to help me go through those chapters. So okay, we're going to go through some of them together, and today we're going to do hematology. So if you want to follow along, I am using the 2021 uh, text for first aid. And we're just going to go through it casually, but also very fast. I want something that's very fast paced where you know what to highlight and want to know what to pay attention to based on what I've collected from um, what I've learned from the question bank. So without further ado, let's get started and read Hematology and Alcoholic together. Uh, let me just see if I want to put a timer on here if I want to. So right now it's 3 o'clock, so let's see if we can get this done in an hour and a half. Let's see if we can get through Hematology and Oncology. So let's just get started. Like I said, I'm just going to highlight and point towards what is important based on the information that I've gathered from doing questions in the Q-Bank. So let's get started. Uh, hematology and oncology. So let's see the embryology. So what's important here? We have basically four different places where you can start to make erythropoiesis. You have the yolk sac, you have the liver, you have the spleen, and you have the bone marrow. But what's most important here is the bone marrow is generally when we start to shift from uh, fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. And this is important because this tends to start at around six months. So if you have an issue with making either alpha or beta, specifically beta, uh, globulin change. Remember that adult hemoglobin is two alpha and two beta. You're going to start to see symptoms at around six months. So that's what's important to know here. If you take a look at the chart here, you can see that right away. Where we start to make a C, which is the adult hemoglobin, at around six months. So that's what's important to know. Most of it is starting to go now. before that, what do you have? You have the four other places the yolk sac, the liver, and the spleen. There's nothing really important here for you to know about high yield except for HPS here. That's generally the main. Uh, the main type of hemoglobin that you have, uh, and it tends to decrease. So when you have this cross section here, when you start to lose that HPS and you start to make that HPA, uh, and then you start to need that beta globulin, essentially the most important thing you need to know is that uh, beta thalassemia will start to show at six months. So that's what's important for you here. So you have the two types of, uh, you have the embryo embryonic globulins, which are theta and epsilon, then you start to develop the hemoglobin F, alpha 2, and uh, gamma 2. Is alpha, uh, that's gamma 2. And then you have adult hemoglobin, which is alpha 2 and beta 2. So what is the key difference here? The key difference, the only thing you really need to know is that it has less added binding to T3-BPG. T3-BPG, when it binds to the hemoglobin, it makes it more stable. And when it makes it more stable, I'm uh, sorry, it doesn't make it more stable. It makes it more relaxed state. So the relaxed state in the hemoglobin allows it to let go of oxygen and give it to the tissues. So that's what T3-BPG does. Uh, when you think about it, it makes a lot of physiological sense that you want a type of hemoglobin that has a very high affinity to oxygen, uh, and so that you are able to hold the oxygen from the maternal hemoglobin for the baby. So HDF has less binding to 2,3-BPG, and therefore it has a higher affinity to oxygen. And that makes perfect sense. It also makes sense to want to cause HDF formation in certain people who are susceptible to a certain disease due to hypoxia. And the example is sickle cell anemia. So in sickle cell, you have a cell that is triggered, uh, the sickling is triple, uh, triggered due to hypoxia. So if I give them something that increases HDF, now I have a new type of hemoglobin with HDF that's more stable. It is not going to let go of its oxygen. It's so very resistant to hypoxia, and therefore, I will decrease the amount of time the patient undergoes tickling. So we can do that by a drug called hydroxyurea. So let's uh, let's make a little note here for ourselves. So we give hydroxy we give hydroxyurea to a sickle cell patient because it increases, right? It increases HBF. And HBS has, like we said, an increased affinity to oxygen because it has decreased to 3 bpg So it's more stable, it's more resistant to hypoxia, and you won't have those events of sickness as often. So that's a very high level to be aware of. Next is you have the AVO classifications. It's very important to know. So everyone has a different blood type. And what dictates this is the antibodies essentially in the plasma that you're going to develop. So a type A person has a type A antigen, and therefore you have anti B antibodies. The type B person has type B antigens, and you have type A antibodies. So what does that mean? It means a type A person can only receive blood from a type A person, or not a type B person, because if they receive that, you're going to have a reaction. Uh, 
the most important thing is to really look at type A, B, and O here. So A, B have antigens A and B, but they have no antibodies. So that means that no matter what type of blood type I give them, they don't have antibodies, they're not going to make a reaction. So they are the universal receiver. So on type O blood, they have no antigens, but they have antibodies for both. So you cannot give them any blood because they're going to have a reaction. So you cannot give them any A or B blood. You can only give them type O blood, but they are therefore a universal donor because they don't have any antigens on their surface to trigger other reactions. So they can donate. Uh, they cannot receive. The AB, on the other hand, cannot receive, um, uh, can receive anything, but they also cannot donate to the other two because the other guys here, A and B, have antibodies against A and B. So that's something to be aware of. You have two types of diseases here called hemolytic disease, uh, the type of hemolytic diseases of the newborn. You have, you have RH and you have ABO. So the key thing is to know the difference between the two of them in a clinical vignette. So you're going to have a patient, a baby who is just born and has John disease, thinking that it's due to a disease. You want to know which is the cause. So the first thing you want to know is look at the mother. Uh, if there's any information in a clinical vignette to clue you in on which one, which type of hemolytic disease the fetus is having. So you have ABO, hemolytic disease. And that tends to be an exclusive to a type O mother, and she's having a type A or B fetus. So you, we can see that right away that that makes sense, because a type O mother would have antibodies against A and B. So if she's pregnant, her antibodies are going to pass through the placenta and start to attack the fetal RBC. And this is an exclusively type O mother with an A or B fetus. Now the RH disease is an RH negative patient with an RH positive fetus. So if there's any clues to this, like say she's had a first pregnancy was normal and now this is her second pregnancy, that might clue you in that it's actually RH hemolytic disease. There tends to be a rule that ABO will happen regardless because she already has the antibody. Whereas in RH disease, her first pregnancy kind of gives her a grace period where she may have interacted her her uh, blood may have reacted with the fetal red blood cells while in labor, and then she would have developed antibodies by the time of the second pregnancy to the second pregnancy infection. But ABO, as we can see right away, uh, she already has these antibodies ready, um, to A and anti B, so does it matter? So the first pregnancy might be the one that's affected here, so that's important to know. Uh, the other thing is generally how does the first pregnancy present? Now you might get confused and think that like ABO blood reactions that we are aware of, they can be very severe reactions, so I would think of a very severe anemia, but actually it's a very mild jaundice that, uh, that occurs here with ABO hemolytic disease. On the other hand, you have RH hemolytic disease, you have a severe type of anemia that results in can even have things like severe high drop of the palace and jaundice and pernicturous afterwards. How do we avoid RH uh, hemolytic disease? It's by giving anti D immunoglobulin to an RH negative mother. You give it twice, you give it once in the third trimester, and then you give it after labor. The next thing to be aware of is the type of cells. So the most important types of cells are listed. This is very easy, it's very interesting to go through. Uh, the most important thing, again, I'm only highlighting the most important stuff, is to know what it looks like and to know a key feature in certain pathology. So we're looking at a neutrophil right now, and it is involved in the acute inflammatory response. And it has a multi-lobe nucleus. So if we take a look here, we can see that it has one, two, three, four, five lobes. So sometimes I might see a hypersegmented neutrophil, which is listed here as part of certain pathologies, as part of certain pathologies which are um, here, the hypersegmented neutrophils, such as vitamin B12 deficiency and folate deficiency. So in these cases, I would have a case of an anemia, which we call anemia, and we also have a feature of a hypersegmented neutrophil, uh, and that would zoom me in on it being a vitamin B12 or a folate deficiency. The next thing to be aware of are what are the contents of the visitors and what do they secrete. So they are involved in, with the inflammatory response. So they have all of these substances like LAP, collagen, like like and lactoferrin, which is involved in the inflammatory response, or they're going to attract more neutrophils to the area or other types of cells or basophils to the area uh, for that inflammatory response. So that's gen uh, generally all you need to know for neutrophils, and they also have this doughy body here, uh, which can be seen. Let's uh, highlight that in a different color. If you do get this picture, those are doughy bodies part of the neutrophils. Next are the erythrocytes. So these are our red blood cells. So cells is a misnomer because they are not cells at all. They are essentially uh, a bag that contains just a whole bunch of chem enzymes and chemicals that are able to pick up oxygen and deliver it to the tissues and then take back 
uh, CO2 to the lungs. So we know that as their basic of our research sites, they are not cells, however, because they lack organelles and they have no mitochondria. And this is very important. They are also have a nucleus. They have no nucleus. They have no cells. They lack mitochondria. That's important. Its shape normally is biconcave. So they might have something that's not biconcave, like sickle cells, for example, or spheres, like hereditary spheres, or cases. And the reason for the line is by concave shape is to increase the surface area to volume ratio, which allows for rapid gas exchange. And it's important to know that they have a lifespan of 120 days. In some diseases, that lifespan is increased. And in some diseases, that decreased lifespan is protected for certain, against certain diseases that respond to, that have a certain predilection to erythrocytes, and we'll discuss that later. The sources of energy are glucose, and most of it comes from glycolysis, and the best comes from the HMP shunt. They do contain chloride and bicarbonate in disorder. Uh, that's something you may have a question on. Another important thing to be aware of is reticulocytes. So reticulocytes are immature red blood cells, and these immature RBCs, they reflect erythroid proliferation. So I want to show you what that looks like here, where... Um, so let's just see here, reticulocyte ribosomal RNA. It's important to know what that looks like in case you get a picture of this on your exam. So let's take a look at this picture here. This is what a reticulocyte looks like. It's an immature RBC. And we said RBCs, they don't have organelles, right? But they do on their way while they're being developed. They just tend, they lose it on their way out. So um, they might have remnants left over. So on the very new or immature RBCs, that are still in the circulation here, they might have these little blue dots here, which are stained with methyl and blue, and these are ribosomal RNA. So you're definitely going to get a question on that. You're going to see this picture that looks like an RBC, and you're seeing these little blue dots. If they ask what that is, that is ribosomal RNA. That is very important for you to, uh, to be aware of. I'm going to highlight that in red so that you remember it. Next, we have the thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are platelets. Platelets, we know, are involved in primary chemostasis. They are anucleate. They are derived from sites and they have a lifespan of 10 days. They contain substances that either cause more platelet aggregation or platelet activation. These are calcium, ADP, serotonin, and histamine. They also have something called alpha granules, which contains four very important things called one milligram factor, fibrinogen, fibronectin, and platelet factor four. So all these things are with the letter F, which is important to you Monogram factor, fibrinogen, fibronectin, and platelet factor 4. Platelet factor 4, if you recall, is part of something called HIPS. So if you have antibodies against this, you might develop something called HIPS, which occurs uh, in people who are taking heparin. So that's important. If antibodies against platelet factor 4, uh, that's another high yield point to be aware of. Next is monocytes. There's nothing really important here except to know what they look like. They're prostatite plasma. They have macrophages, which do a lot of stuff with regards to inflammation. They pick up the uh, bacteria, they phagocytose it, they pick up the cellular debris, the red blood cells. The more important thing here is to know that they can function as antigen producing cells via MHC2. So the important thing is to think that you have this state of inflammation that is immediately caused by infection, right? So they're picking up the cellular debris and all that, uh, you know, the remnants of this battlefield essentially. They can and take it and present it to the immune cells so that the immune cells have a certain memory uh, so that the next time an infection happens, they're able to respond more effectively. So they are able to do this, so they are a type of uh, antigen preventing cell. The key thing to know about macrophages is sometimes their name is changed depending on where they are. So in the liver, they are called proper cells. In the connective tissue, they are called cytosites. In the skin, they are called Langer's cells. In the bones, they are called osteoclasts. In the brain, they are called microglial cells. That's important. Next we have the eosinophils. So we know from, uh, from parasitology that eosinophils are always like the the major cell involved with common pick infection. So we're thinking parasites uh, here. So we have eosinophilia whenever you get that you want to think of parasites. However, there is actually a huge, huge list of reasons why you might have eosinophilia, and that's very important to know. You have parasites, you have asthma, so any allergic reaction, any asthma, uh, any allergic process here you want to think you're going to find it synophilia, but you'll also find it in other conditions like myeloproliferative disorders, lymphomas, uh, chronic adrenal insufficiency. So it's very high up for you to be aware of when you're going to have synophilia and to be able to rule out anything so that you can think of more important causes like lymphomas and leukemias, which also have synophilia. And synophils have a very important uh, chemical called major basic protein here, which is the health of the problem. So if you get a question that asks you what is it that's within the eosinophils that they're using to kill these parasites, it is major basic protein. That's very important. 
Next is basic with the math help. These types of very similar to each other. They tend to be involved with the allergic reaction process. Basic fields contain heparin and histamine, uh, and that's involved in the allergic reaction. You have mast cells, which are very important. They are also associated with allergic reactions. And you want to always associate mast cells with type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. When they ask you what's going on, you're going to answer the question by saying, well, there's binding to the FC portion of IgE to the membrane. And that's going to trigger something which we call degranulation. And that degranulation is going to cause release of histamine, heparin, tryptate, and acinophil chemotactic factors. Remember, this acinophil chemotactic factor is what's going to bring the acinophils to the allergic uh, to the area where there or an allergic process is going on or where asthma is going on. Yeah. So the person who triggered that, as a cell that triggers that, is the mast cell. So that's important to know. There are other ways to trigger a mast cell degranulation, and that can be through vancomycin or opioids or radiocontract dye. So you want to think of people who are taking um, opioids, they are itching a lot. That itching is coming from uh, histamine, which is coming from degranulation of the mast cells. So that's another uh, important fact to know. You also have people who are uh, suffering from asthma. You might want to consider, since the basis of the pathology is coming from the mast cells, you might want to consider uh, preventing the degranulation of these mast cells to avoid an asthma attack. And so we can use mast cell uh, uh, stabilizers or uh, these drugs that we call chromaline sodium, uh, which will prevent the degranulation of mast cells. That's important as well. Next, we're only trying to get through as fast as possible the high yield stuff here. So we have lymphocytes, and we're going to discuss them right now. You have the natural killer cells, which are an important part of innate immunity. They kill the viruses, the big guys, the viruses and the cancer cells. You have B cells. So B cells are part of the humoral immune response. And then you have T cells, which are part of the cellular immune response. The humoral immune response essentially can make it as brief as possible for you. Anything that's going to interact with the B cell is going to tell it to create an immunoglobulin. Uh, which is going to respond to that specific type of infection. So they migrate to peripheral lymphoid tissue. So that happens in the lymphoid tissue where they receive some information, right? And then they are going to develop and base B cells are going to start to differentiate into plasma cells, and then those plasma cells are going to produce antibodies and memory cells uh, so then we can uh, better effectively uh, clear out infection the next time that it happens. The key thing why they're called B cells is that they mature in the bone and marrow. Next, you have the T cells. These are called B cells because they mature in the thymus. So you have two spikes. You have the CD4 helper cells and you have the uh, CD8 cells, cytotoxic cells. So you have the cytotoxic cells, CD8, and they recognize MHC1. So one way to remember that is 1 times 8 is 1. And then you have the T cells, uh, the helper cells, which are CD4 and recognize MHC1. Uh, sorry, 1 times 8 is 8, and then you have the helper T cells, which is like CD4, and they recognize MHC2, so 4 times 2 is 8, that's one way to remember it. Then you have, uh, I'm guessing last but not least, yes, is the plasma cells, so these plasma cells are what are responsible for developing and producing the antibodies. You have a cross-based chromatin, and the important thing is that they are part of a lot of technologies, the most important one is multiple myeloma, which is called a plasma cell, it's crazy, so... Uh, this is important for multiple myeloma. So if I find a condition where uh, I, I take a sample and I see elevated plasma cells more than a certain number, then you are going to consider multiple myeloma. That's an important pathology here. Next is hemoglobin electrophoresis. So hemoglobin electrophoresis is one way for us to figure out hemoglobin. It's very interesting and very simple to understand. So you'll have a cathode here that's negative, and then you have an anode here, which is positive, right? You have these, uh, in the electrophoresis, if you've ever seen it, you have these wells here, and you plug, you put in your sample, and then you run an electric current through, uh, through this sample, right? So when you run an electric current, you know that negatives are going to attract the positive, uh, and positives are going to attract the negatives. So based on the location of where I, when, I, when I turn off the circuit, I, I look at the uh, gel, and then I can determine based on its location what type of hemoglobin we're going to have. So what does that mean? So let's take a look at what normal adult hemoglobin has. Adult hemoglobin has uh, glutamic acid. So glutamic acid is a negatively charged, correct? So we said that negative is a positive. So if I run a current from here, right, this is going to go as far as possible and as close as possible to the anode. So that's how I know I'm dealing with a normal adult hemoglobin, because it's very negatively charged due to, due to the glutamic acid. Remember, acid is a negatively charged. So what happens if I'm dealing with someone who has sickle cell disease? Well, what happens here? Sickle cell disease, you switch the G, right, to a V. 
Valiant, which is very neutral. It's very neutral, right? This guy's like right in the middle. So if I run a current through this well, uh, it's going to be somewhere around the middle. It's uh, not going to be attracted too much to the positive. It's not going to be attracted too much to the negative. It's neutral. So it's going to be somewhere around the middle. Now what happens if I have something like HBC disease? HBC disease, I switch the G to an L. And lysine is positively charged. So if I run a current through it, it's going to stick a little bit closer to the cathode, the negative charge side, right? Because positive is attracted to negative. So the one that's closer to the cathode is going to be my HBC disease. A very simple way to understand that. Uh, and it's a very interesting thing to uh, be able to use to uh, sorry, I lost my connection here for a second. Uh, it's a very simple thing for me to use to be able to uh, determine what type of disease you're dealing with. So let's take a look here and see what they're saying. On hemoglobin, uh, on a gel, hemoglobin migrates from the negative charge to the positive charge. So HPA migrates the farthest. Remember, we said that's because it has the glutamic acid, which is negative. But if you switch the glutamic uh, acid with daily, which is neutral in HBC to be, and HBS to be, uh, or lysine, which is positive, then you're going to have changes in the direction that the gel is moving in. Next, you have Coombs test. The most important thing for Coombs test, two particular diseases, or oh, plenty of uh, diseases actually. But for the sake of scheme, let's just focus on two of them. You have autoimmune hemolytic anemia uh, and hereditary psychosis. We use the Coombs test to differentiate between them. Why? Because they both look exactly the same. You're going to have hereditary serocytosis. And you're going to either have the Coombs negative or the Coombs positive. If you have hereditary serocytosis, and if you see a negative Coombs test, it's hereditary serocytosis. If you see serocytes and positive Coombs test, it is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, so we can use here, I believe they, they do not list here uh, the different diseases, but we'll see that across the throughout the rest of this reading. So let's take a look at platelet fund formation. If they ask you what is the first step, so you've injured yourself, you've cut yourself, what's going to happen? The first thing, the first thing is vasoconstriction. Endothelial injury is going to trigger vasoconstriction. So you've injured your endothelium. So what happens next? You've exposed the endothelium and you've exposed the collagen that's underneath. That is going to trigger something called von Willebrand factor to attach to that collagen. The, coll the von Willebrand factor, if you remember, we just said it came from the platelets, from the alpha granules, but it also comes from the uh, endothelium, from something called vivo filet bodies. It comes from two places, the vivo filet bodies, or from the alpha granules. So let's just draw that here to depict that. You have cells here, the erythrocytes, uh, sorry, the endothelium, and you have this injury, this injured area right here. And now you, there's collagen here, and that collagen, now you have von Willebrand factor, which is going to attach here. So that's exposure. The von Willebrand is going to be exposed, binds to the exposed collagen, and now you're going to trigger uh, the platelet plug formation. That's the, what's going to happen is you're going to end up having a platelet, and that platelet is going to adhere to that von Willebrand factor. Uh, von Willebrand factor. It's going to adhere, and the adherence is mediated by a receptor called GP1B receptor. So that GP1B receptor right here is going to bind to the von Willebrand factor, which is bounded to the collagen uh, here that was exposed on injury of the endothelium. The next step is very simple, is to see that now that I have adhesion, well, I'm going to be activated. So remember, we said the platelets have four things. We have calcium, we have ADP, we have uh, from boxing AT, you have a whole bunch of chemicals inside of it, and those things are going to become activated now. So these things are all irritants. They're going to cause a configuration and configurational change within the platelet. And what are they again? You have ADP and you have calcium. Remember, calcium is going to go ahead and trigger another way for us to stop bleeding, which is the population cascade. But this, this platelet, this temporary platelet plug is just what we need for now until we can trigger the big guys, which is the coagulation cascade. Uh, so now that we've, act we've appeared, we've activated, what happens in activation is a receptor is going to show up on here called GP2 
keep it to be 3A, uh, and that is due to activation, which trigger which triggers uh, PTY12 receptor. So you have ADP, that ADP that was released. It's going to trigger the. Uh, it's going to induce PTY12, which is going to induce GP2 to be 3A. So we have a lot of things to think about right now in terms of pharmacology. But before we do that, let's take a look at aggregation. So when I have this GP2 to be 3A receptor on my platelet, that's what's going to connect other platelets to that area, along with fibrinogen. So fibrinogen binds. So let's have, use a different color here. Fibrinogen here is now going to bind to this GP. I'm going to put two here, and this is one, so you don't get confused. Uh, GP2, the. Oh, actually, let me argue. Oh, no. Okay. Let me just erase that because that's not perfect. Okay, so this is one, and that's GP2, B3A. So you have fibrinogen, which is going to bind. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have fibrinogen here, which is going to bind GP2B3A, which was induced by PTY12, which was induced by ADP, right? And that ADP was induced by von Willebrand's factor binding to GP1A. That's the way to think about this. So uh, this fibrinogen is now going to connect with other. Uh, with other platelets. And that's how we make our that's how we make our platelet plug, uh, which is a means of temporary hemostasis essentially. By the time you have um, the big guys, which are the coagulation cascade, triggered by the calcium over here, which we will discuss later. So you want to think of this in terms of pharmacology. So what's going on here? That means that I have very different ways of preventing clots from developing, right? The first one being, I either, let's use a different color here, either I affect this, or I affect this receptor, or I affect the uh, ADP, or I affect the GP1B receptor, or I affect the uh, P2Y12. So I can essentially stop platelet formation if I have certain medications that can target any of these receptors along the way of the fusion, activation, and aggregation. The other important thing to be aware of is this balance that occurs between pro aggregation factors and anti aggregation factors. So I don't want like that exposure that we have here. Uh, sorry, let me erase that. The exposure that we have. The exposure that we're dealing with, right? It's only happening on this area that's been exposed, right? I don't want. I want clots to form here to stop the bleeding, but I don't want clots to form on the neighboring cells. So the neighboring cells are secreting these anti-aggregation factors. So that the clot is happening specifically where I need it. I don't want the whole body to be triggered if there's clots everywhere, right? And I don't want them to go in places that I don't want them to be. So uh, you have a balance between these anti-aggregation factors and the pro-aggregation factors. So what is released by the endothelial cells that are normal, that have not been injured, are PG12 and nitric oxide. So that's important. You have the nitric oxide, think no platelets here, no, uh, no platelet aggregation. We don't want that. So the endothelium that has not been injured is creating these compounds uh, to prevent platelet aggregation, and that's important. At the, end of, at the end of the day, at the end of all of this, you have a temporary platelet plug which stops bleeding, but it is unstable and it's easily discharged, dislodged. So you want a coagulation cascade to be triggered in the meantime, which is secondary to the solutions which we will discuss to create a more robust uh, platelet plug, essentially, a more robust uh, clot to hold things together and prevent bleeding. So let's take a look again and quickly review everything that we said here. So we have here again we have some endothelial collagen, right? So this is a normal cell, and that's a normal cell. We have an area here that's been exposed. So we have exposed here to the collagen, and now we have von Willebrand factor that has just bound bounded to this collagen. It has bounded through GP1B. 
So I have two diseases already that we can talk about. We have von Willebrand disease, where somebody has a deficiency in this, or we have Bernard, uh, Bernard Soulier syndrome, where someone has a deficiency in gc one b So automatically I know that in these two diseases, I'm going to have an issue with something called a Rhizocetin FA. So you're going to have sometimes a, a word called uh, failure of aggregation on Rhizocetin test. Think two diseases that only show this, GP1B deficiency or von Willebrand factor deficiency. So it's Bernard Soulier or uh, w, uh, VWF disease. So those are two conditions that I need to be aware of. And since we're talking about platelets, the key thing to know about platelets is they affect bleeding time. So any of these diseases that we're talking about right now, we're going to have an increase in bleeding time. So you want to look for other high yield words. So if you have an increase in bleeding time plus no aggregation on rhizocetin SA or rhizocetin aggregation test, you're going to have GP1B or von Willebrand factor one. Think of these two conditions. Let's move on to the next thing. So we said when this bound, uh, when this binding happens, you're going to have an activation. That activation is going to be due to uh, insertion of this receptor on the surface. So this side's going to be triggered, and that that's going to cause insertion of this new receptor, GP2B. To B3A on the surface of the platelet. So what's going to happen here? I'll just say the rest of it to make things a bit more uh, simple for you. So, so we have PG, uh, P2Y12 ADP receptor is going to trigger GP2B3A insertion. And then this guy is going to bind to fibrinogen. And that is going to bind to the other platelet, uh, GP2B3A. So how can I stop this from, uh, using pharmacology? So I either I'm going to stop the ADP receptor using these oh. drugs such as clopidogrel, or I will stop this receptor, GP2B3A, and these are the drugs that we use, Fixamab, and I cannot pronounce the rest of these, don't ask me to do that, um, or I prevent it using aspirin. Aspirin will prevent that platelet activation part, which releases those uh, irritant compounds that trigger activation and aggregation to the area that we need to clot. So aspirin works by irreversible blockade of cough enzyme, which converts arachidonic acid to the moxidonic acid. So those are uh, ways that we can uh, prevent a clot from forming. The next thing we want to be aware of is something called glands thrombocemia, and that's a deficiency in GP2B3A. One thing to keep in mind is that both of, if I'm giving a person a drug like one of these three, you might have what looks like glandular thrombocemia. You're going to have some kind of question that requires that thing for you to know that these diseases or this, these drugs are due to some affection on this receptor here. So again, this is just a quick review of that. So formation of it, so we, what we want at the end of the day is the formation of an insoluble fibrin in mesh. So aspirin, we said, irreversibly binds to cox and prevents the thromboxin A2 synthesis. Then you have clopidogrel and prasugrel and ficagrelor, uh, which inhibit that ADP expression of that P2Y12 receptor. So we're preventing that formation of GP2B3A by preventing the induction of ADP receptors, right? Capsicumab is going to directly inhibit GP2B3A. Rhizocetin activates von Willebrand factor to bind GP1B. So failure of aggregation on this rhizocetin assay occurs in two diseases. So remember, if I get a case where I have increased bleeding time and failure of aggregation in rhizocetin assay, I'm going to highlight that in red for you. Because this is a buzzword and uh, can very quickly help you get the right answer, is you want to think of von Willebrand disease or Bernard Soulier. Now you have another drug here called Desmopectin, which promotes the release of von Willebrand factor and factor eight from the endothelial cells. Desmopressin is therefore something we can use in the case of hemophilia, where hemophilia you have factor eight deficiency, or in the case of von Willebrand factor disease. So in both of these, it promotes the release. Remember, it comes from two places, von Willebrand factor, from the platelets or from the endothelia. So in two conditions, von Willebrand disease and, and hemophilia, you may give desmopressin to increase that uh, those levels of either von Willebrand factor factor 8. And the important thing is that von Willebrand factor kind of carries 
factor eight. When I think of von Willebrand factor as like an older brother carrying von, uh, factor eight on his back. So if I have an issue with this uh, von Willebrand factor, I'm going to have a condition where I have an infringement. Uh, the best of the coagulation of the coagulation system. So it's very important to keep in mind. Uh, and therefore we can use, like we said, we can use this So where have we heard this oppressant uh, before? Where have we heard the name of this drug? Uh, so this oppressant we said here, we can now use it for two conditions. You have von Willebrand factor uh, disease, you have hemophilia A, and then you also have another condition. If you remember, this oppressant is the analog of vasopressin. So we can use it uh, in the treatment of central diabetes uh, insipidus, where somebody is uh, not producing uh, the correct levels of ADH, we can use that from person to treat that condition. So don't forget to the uh, links between the different uh, systems. So now we're going to talk about the coagulation uh, pathway. It's a bit daunting, and, uh, but it's nothing to be uh, intimidated by. So very easily, we start off by the extrinsic pathway. So I'm going to start off by extrinsic because that's the fastest part to learn. We only want to think of it as I need something more robust than the little platelet that I, the little platelet uh, plug that I just made. So we need the coagulation cascade for that. So the very basic things you need to know about this is there's two main pathways. You have the intrinsic pathway and you have the extrinsic pathway. And we need to know how to differentiate between the two of them. And the best way to differentiate between them is using that the extrinsic pathway. Extrinsic is like you're outside. So you, when you're outside, you want to play tennis. So any disease that is affecting the extrinsic pathway, you're going to have an increase in PT. But the intrinsic pathway is inside. So inside, you play table tennis, right? When you play table tennis, that's going to be increased. So that's an issue of the intrinsic pathway. Then you want to look at the common pathway. So both of these guys here, the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway, are going to activate the common pathway. So this is the common ground between both of them. So let's take a look at what's happening in the extrinsic pathway. You have tissue factor, which is whenever you have exposed anything or damage to cells, and they're going to release this tissue factor. So you have factor seven. So this is a test of factor seven. I don't know why this uh, program does this um, here. So this is factor seven. No, okay, it's not highlighted properly, so it's going to stick to the You have factor seven. Factor seven is going to go and activate factor 10. And then factor 10 is going to activate factor 2, which is prothrombin. Factor 2 is going to fa activate factor 1. And then at the end of the day, you're going to have factor 1 along with factor 13. And some calcium, you're going to get a fibrin mesh, which stabilizes that platelet plug. You need to stabilize it using fibrin, right? So uh, the numbers, you have 10, 2, 1. That's it. 10, 2, 1 is the common pathway. 10, 2, 1. So if I went 7, 10, 2, 1, that's extrinsic pathway from the common. The rest are extrinsic pathway. So how can I utilize this, you know, to get the most high yield points there? Anything that affects the extrinsic pathway, we said, increases uh, platelet time. So, uh, sorry, not platelet time, it's on the time. Uh, so, increases PT. So, if I'm dealing with something such as vitamin K deficiency, right? We know vitamin K deficiency affects factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So, obviously, it affects a lot of the factors here that are. Um, involved with a common pathway, as well as one path, one path from the intrinsic pathway, but also specifically targets this factor 7, which is exclusively in the extrinsic pathway. So one such way for me to know that I'm um, dealing with vitamin K deficiency, for example, is if I'm seeing increased PT. For the rest of them, let's take a look very quickly. So you have basement membrane collagen that's been exposed and then activated the platelets. So you're going to go 12, 11, 9, 10. Okay, so you're going backwards, but you're just switching these two here. 12, 11, 9, and 10. And then you're going to continue with the common. 10, 2, 1. Okay. Uh, factor 8 and factor 9A activate factor, go into the activation of factor 10 to 10A. So that's also important. Factor 8, if you remember, with von Willebrand factor here, are going to activate factor 10. Um, let me see if there's anything else that is important here. There's a lot of important things. Like for me personally, I use the boards and beyond uh, video to help me get through this. Uh, the most important thing here is now at the end of all of these pathways, you now have a stabilized plug. And with that stabilized plug, 
if there ever comes a time for me to degrade it, right? Like I'm done with this clot, I don't need it anymore. Our body has ways of breaking that up, that um, clot. So that is done through the conversion of plasminogen to plasma. It's done by an enzyme called C8. So I have thrombolytics, which are drugs that can break down clots, because some, patholo some pathologies are based on clot formation. So I have things like alkaplase, structural kinase, which can do that. Or I have antifibrinolytics, such as aminocuprolic acid and trinogenic trans, acid. When I do break down the clot, the most important thing for you to know is that you're going to have something called fibrin degradation products, which are uh, D-dimers. So a D-dimer test is what you use to determine if there's a clot that's being made and it was broken down in the system. So um, we can use that as a clue for us that a clotting, a, a pathology where in which there is a clot uh, has it has occurred within the body. So that is to what we call a good. Let me see if I can write this down. That is what you call a good. We call that a good uh, negative test. What does that mean? It means that so long as there's if I have a D-dimer that's elevated, I know there's a clotting problem that's a clot happened. It's not specific to anything. So um, what that means is that if there is a D-dimer with a clotting pathology, then I know that I'm probably not dealing with a clotting pathology in the first place. So that's what's my good name test. So for example, if you have a swelling in the leg, uh, in the calf of the patient, and you think it's a DDT, but you do D-dimer and it's negative, the chances are it's not a uh, DBT. So it's a good negative test for me to exclude that it's not the pathology. So that's what was meant by a good negative test. Next, you have vitamin K dependent coagulation. Vitamin K. Uh, so vitamin K is formed in the liver. That's important to know. So you might get questions where you have a patient who's an alcoholic who drinks a bottle of wine every single day, uh, and they might ask you, well, what the effect are they going to have in, the, in this whole uh, coagulation pathway? And you're going to see that vitamin K, you want a reduced form of vitamin K, and you get that reduced form from an epoxide reductase enzyme. So you want a reduced form of vitamin K, which is going to be used in the gamma glutamyl carboxylation of these vitamin K dependent clotting factors. And which ones are they? Are 2, 7, 9, and 10. And proteins T and S. And proteins T and S are um, anticoagulants that we have in our body. So these two are anticoagulants and these are the clotting factors. So again, reduced vitamin K by epoxide reductase is needed for gamma glutamyl uh, carboxylation of these inactive T7, 9, and 10 and protein C and S, and then they become activated. So you have a case of a patient who drinks a bottle of wine every day. What are they going to have as a deficiency? You're going to have an issue with this process here, the gamma glutamyl carboxylate enzyme, uh, decreased synthetic function of the liver. So that's why they have bleeding disorders uh, in people who have cirrhosis and people who have liver failure. So vitamin K deficiency, you're going to have the key synthesis of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and protein C and S. Uh, so warfarin is the drug that we use to prevent this epoxide reductase from uh, working. So warfarin or liver failure, these two conditions here, this epoxide reductase is not going to work, and this glutamyl carboxylation is not going to work uh, because you don't have your reduced vitamin K. So these factors here are going to be decreased in both of these conditions. So that's how warfarin works in preventing a clot from forming. So you have warfarin that inhibits the vitamin K epoxide reductase. So we can deal with by using uh, warfarin overdose by treating the patient with vitamin K to reverse the inhibitory effect of warfarin. However, it's not completely feasible because you might want uh, a quicker uh, response. So for that, you actually use fresh frozen plasma or PCC, um, which is for thrombin concentrate to uh, undo an overdose of warfarin. Uh, neonates lack impure bacteria, so some conditions occur where you have naturally this decreased vitamin K, and that can be in neonates because they have no bacteria, impure bacteria, they have a deficiency in that, and that impure bacteria actually helps us absorb the vitamin K, so that's not happening, or produce the vitamin K. Then you have, uh, so to avoid this, generally giving the child a vitamin K uh, shot is going to help them. Administration of vitamin K overcomes neonatal deficiency in coagulopathy. You have fact, the two things you do have to be aware of is factor 7 and factor 2. So factor 7 has the shortest half-life and factor 2 has the longest half-life. Uh, the important thing here is to really understand something with regards to warfarin. 
and a certain way that it works with this vitamin K for a prevention of activation of these vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. And that's when we take a look at uh, protein C and S. So you have a problem here with protein C and S because they are anticoagulants. If you give warfarin, uh, the anticoagulants actually get inactivated first. So if I'm blocking my anticoagulants, I actually have a state where I'm procoagulant. By the time the uh, the warfarin goes to inhibit the uh, these factors. So factor two, I mean, it has a long half life. So it takes time for warfarin to actually stop factor two. And if you remember, factor two is part of the common system. I remember we went ten and uh, two and one. So uh, if you stop your anticoagulants from working, you actually have a procoagulant state, which is why in therapy, when you need warfarin, you actually do something called a Coumadin bridge. That Coumadin, uh, sorry, it's, hefer, it's Coumadin with a heparin bridge. Okay, so uh, to, to cover ourselves from that, anti, uh, from that procoagulant state, that transient procoagulant state, uh, you give heparin to avoid uh, any further uh, costs from developing, which can happen because now I've just canceled out these two vital anticoagulants that the body uses to break down uh, clots. So what happens here is protein C, activated protein C, along with protein S, right, both of these guys will cleave factors 7 and uh, factor 5 and factor 7. So that's important, factor 5 and factor 7. The next thing which is more interesting, uh, very easy to learn are the different types of RBC morphology. Like hematology for me is one of the easier things to start off with and learn from. And generally very useful for a whole bunch of other systems because a lot of things are interconnected. So you have here the acanthocytes. So let's just take a look at them. What do we see? We see like these uh, things that are sticking out of it, right? But they're not very equal in comparison to the bird cells that you see here. They look very evenly dispersed here, right? But these are not very evenly dispersed. These are cancelocytes. Where do we see them? We see them in liver disease, vitamin E deficiency, and A-beta-lipoproteinemia. Key thing here with vitamin E deficiency. If you have uh, neural degeneration plus anemia, Think vitamin E deficiency, you're likely to get a question on that. So you're going to get a patient who has decreased vibration, decreased proprioception, a whole bunch of decreases in all of their senses, plus anemia. Think of vitamin E deficiency. Uh, and the, vitamin E deficiency is tocopherol. So these projections are at irregular intervals. Now you have uh, these Burr cells. So these are important because these are seen in end stage renal disease and in uh, pyruvate kinase deficiency. The next cell is these teardrop cells uh, called dacrocytes. So what's going on here? You have, remember that the RBCs, they come out of the bone marrow, right? So if my bone marrow is filled with stuff, like it's infiltrated, and now the RBCs need to squeeze themselves out of it, so that squeezing is going to cause that tear shape that you see there. So this is um, the tear shaped dacrocytes, and we see that in myelofibrosis. Next is the schistocytes. So schistocytes are helmet cells. It's basically an RBC that passed through something and damaged it, right? And that damage now leaves you with a this helmet, this triangle, these pieces. They're just fragments of RBCs. So think about it. What, what would have passed through to cause damage? Well, maybe it passed through a blood clot, right? Or maybe it passed through a valve, uh, a heart valve that damaged it. So these are the conditions that would have these schistocytes. You have uh, macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia like the IC. In HUS, so all of these have clots in them. So as it's passing through, these clots are going to get injured. Or a mechanical hemolysis through a heart valve cause species. So these are the fragmented RBCs, and that's what they look like. You have these degmocytes, and you can't look, understand degmocytes, which occur in G6PD deficiency without taking a look at something called. Where are you? Fine bodies. So in G6PD deficiency, you have a denatured and precipitated hemoglobin iris. That's important. So you have here a denatured RBC. So we call that fine bodies. When it's passing through the spleen, the spleen sees this and it takes a bite out of it to erase it. 
right? Oh no, erase the whole thing. Well, it's gonna take a it's gonna take a bite out of that. It's gonna rip out that hind body. So now you have a bite cell. So in G six P D deficiency, you have two findings. You're gonna have hind bodies and you're gonna have bite cells. Let's go back and see what that looks like. There. So that was there was a hind body here, and the spleen saw it and literally just took a chunk out of it. So that's what happened with the uh, Next is these elithocytes, hereditary elithocytes, I've never seen a carbon on that anywhere. Um, then you have your spherocytes. So spherocytes occur in two conditions. We've already mentioned them before if you're paying attention. Other than hemolytic anemia, don't forget about them. Because the tendency of spherocytes only happens in hereditary spherocytosis. That's not the case. So it differentiates them. But the main thing is the clinical test. When you're clean positive, it's autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If it's clean negative, it is hereditary spherocytosis. So remember that the main shape of RBC is like here, biconcomute. Right? Now you have these hereditary spherocytes, which are very sensitive and they tend to uh, break along the way in their circulation. So you have hereditary spherocytosis. And autoimmune anemia, uh, and we'll discuss that in more detail later. You have your macroovalocytes, so these are very large, large cells, and these are seen in megaloblastic anemia. And also, don't forget that we have hypersegmented neutrophils. Remember what that looks like if you're a neutrophil and it has more than six lobes. And we said megaloblastic anemia with the hypersegmented neutrophils is probably a vitamin B12 or uh, folate deficiency, so don't forget that. Next, you have your target cell. Target cell is very important. The only thing you want to know about this whole chart is to know that the G6 disease has the body cells in the hind body and the target cells. And where do you find the target cell? The target cells is uh, essentially due to some issue with the surface volume. Uh, Area to volume ratio. So there's an increase in surface area to volume ratio, which causes the. Uh, so you're going to have most of the stuff kind of clumps in the middle here, and this space that ends up developing around it, which is the target cell appearing. Where does it appear? HBC disease, asplenia, liver disease, and thalassemia. Thalassemia, target cell. Those are buzzwords. But don't forget asplenia. And don't forget HBC disease, because you can get asked about this. So asplenia, I want to think of something like uh, sickle cell. They might have the target cell as well as the sickle cell. So that's the Thalassemia will have the specific appearance like the chipmunk faces, things like that. HBC, so you don't forget because we love to ask questions about HBC because you're not going to see at your last minute, you're going to focus on the, the big guys, sickle cell disease, and what really is, and things like that. HBC, crystals, targets, done. HBC is crystals and targets. Uh, we'll understand that later. So you have HBC disease, you have target cells, and you're going to have your uh, crystals and, H and HBC. Those are buzzwords for HBC disease. Next is sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease, and that's what it looks like. It looks like a sickle. If you don't know what a sickle is, it's like a farming instrument that they use to like, cut wheat with. Um, it's a farming instrument, so that's what it looks like. It's called sickle cell anemia. So, uh, there are conditions where sickling occurs. So, some people are under the impression that diseases like hereditary spherocytosis and sickle cells are just coming out of the bone marrow looking like that. Or G6PD, where you have a deficiency in an enzyme. People think that you don't make that mistake to think that they're coming out of the bone marrow with this pathology. They come out normal, then they develop that pathology over on. Or something triggers something, a change in their shape, or something like that. So you have hereditary spherocytosis, right? You have a defect in the surface, and then slowly as it's going through the spleen, like you have this biconcave shape, slowly as, as it's going through the spleen, the spleen starts to take out pieces of the membrane, right? So when you start to remove pieces of that membrane, right, you're going to decrease the surface, right, or the, the surface membrane itself. So then it becomes more round. That's what's happening with hereditary In G6PD deficiency, you're going to have a decrease in an enzyme, right? The problem is, is the enzymes that come out with the, from the bone marrow generally have some function. So a key thing to be aware of with G6PD deficiency is if you test for the level of the enzyme after an attack, you're actually going to find the values are going to be normal because you just tested the RBCs that are still fresh. They've just entered the circulation, which have normal levels of the enzyme. So uh, you're going to have a false normal test 
because the, the humanized ones have all, who have the decreased level of the enzyme is already humanized. They're not in the system anymore. They're not testing for them. So that's something to keep in mind. Same thing with hereditary uh, with uh, sickle cell disease. They come out normal, but something happens which causes this polymerization reaction, and you're going to get this sequence here. So what are the things that happen? It's very important to keep in mind. The low oxygen, you have high altitude, you have dehydration, don't forget dehydration, you have decreased oxygen, right? You have your high altitude, you have your acidosis. Uh, all of these things can go ahead and trigger that cyclic. Therefore, we have to consider all of these things with their uh, treatment, right? You want to make sure somebody's hydrated, you want to make sure they are well oxygenated so that this happens. Or if you remember what like I just said uh, a couple minutes ago, which was we can give them something that increases the production of a type of hemoglobin that has a high affinity towards oxygen, which is HBF, so part of our therapy for sickle cell anemia might be hydroxyurea, which does that, which increases HBF, making the, uh, the blood more resistant to hypoxia and thereby decreasing the incidence of sickle. So there are some things that you now will see inside the bone marrow. You have these um, iron granules, which are seen as uroblastic anemia as well as Lead poisoning, keywords for lead poisoning, like uh, uh, lines on the gingiva, neurological uh, manifestations. Now you also have things on the peripheral blood smear. How will we always bond these? These are seen in acelinia. So we have now two things that we do with acelinia. Target cells. Let's write that down. And these how will jolly bodies. Now you have the basophilic stippling, which is seen in sideroblastic anemia. So we have two things with sideroblastic anemia. You have the basophilic stippling. You have the basophilic stippling. And we have the iron granules in the bone marrow. Please do not make this mistake. Basophilic stippling is seen in the peripheral blood smear. Okay, but the iron granules, I'm saying this correctly, yes, the iron granules in the bone marrow, do not make that mistake, you might get confused, you might remember, but then you might forget which one is which. Iron in the bone marrow and sideroblastic anemia, basophilic stippling in the peripheral blood smear, so remember it's BS, basophilic stippling in the Peripheral blood smear, that's how I remember it. Iron is going to go to the Do not make that mistake. Next, you have these Pappenheimer bodies, again, also found in sideroblastic anemia. So we have three things. Two things in peripheral blood smear. You're going to have basophilic sibling, you're going to have the Pappenheimer bodies, and then you're going to have the bone marrow that increased iron. Uh, and the basophilic sibling is due to ribosomal activity. Remember, anything you see that is like blue is going to be ribosomal. So don't forget that ridiculous sites also have. Uh, they're remnants of the ribosome. Let's check your anemia. Anemia is very simple to understand if you memorize this chart here. I don't have it fully memorized. I'll tell you something. I only have microcytic and macrocytic memorized, and anything else falls in between. I just remember if it's an extrinsic or an intrinsic issue with the RBC. So it's very simple to get through, and we're going to go through that right now. You have your microcytic anemias and you have your uh, macrocytic. Let's start with the macrocytic. So macrocytic means very large, it's macro, so you have your MCD with more than 100, right? So it's either megaloblastic or it's non-megaloblastic. So you have essentially, the, way, the best way for me to simplify this for you is you can have vitamin B12 deficiency and folate deficiency. And on the EGM, all you need to know is to differentiate between them. And then you have erotic aciduria where you would have a case of megaloblastic anemia and you tried to treat it by giving the patient both folate and vitamin B12 and it still didn't work, then you're probably dealing with uh, urea. Then you have the effective DNA repair, right which is Fanconi anemia. Then you have the non-megaloblastic type, which is diamond black fan anemia, which is barely ever asked about, and then these two, which is chronic alcohol overuse. Uh, next, when you look at microcytic anemia, just memorize microcytic anemia. You have thalassemia, you have anemia of chronic disease, you have iron deficiency, and you have blood pressure. So whenever I see microcytosis, I'm thinking of these guys. Thalassemia and iron deficiency are going to big guns, essentially. Then anemia of chronic disease, which I need to know how to differentiate it between regular iron deficiency anemia, and then lead poisoning. Next is the normocytic anemia. So normocytic anemia, what does that mean? The size is normal, but 
uh, what is happening? Is there hemolysis happening or, is, or there is no hemolysis? So the non-hemolytic one is essentially for these guys here, the iron deficiency and anemia of chronic disease. For both of them, it's actually early. So at the beginning of this, these new processes, you're going to have uh, a non-hemolytic, uh, a, a normocytic, non-hemolytic type of appearance, and then eventually it's going to be microcytic. The hemolytic type is the one that uh, you might get confused by, but it's very simple to just understand it. Why are the RBCs being destroyed? Are they being destroyed because of an issue with the RBC? Or are they being destroyed because of, is there a hemolysis happening because of something extrinsic to the RBC, something out of this control? So it's easier to start with the intrinsic. Intrinsic, either I have a defect in my membrane, or a defect in my enzyme, or a defect in my chemical. So that defect in my membrane, I already know I'm dealing with either hereditary spherocytosis, or uh, Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So we have here the hereditary spherocytes. You have your spherocytes. You have your paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. There's something, some kind of effect on the membrane uh, which protects it from complement. That's paroxysmal PNH. Or I have an enzyme deficiency. You have two enzymes. The main one is the CTD deficiency. And then you have your pyruvate kinase deficiency. Number one is the CTD. You have to really know that. Hemoglobinopathy is that it's the issue of my hemoglobin that's causing this. Uh, this RBC not to long enough to be penalized. So we have HBC disease and high risk of The extrinsic then is something external to the RBC. It's out of its control, but for some reason, uh, either the screen is attacking it, uh, and then you're getting this extrinsic anemia. It's either autoimmune or microangiopathic or macroangiopathic or some kind of infection like parvovirus B19 that has a predilection for the leukocytes and destroys them, or autoimmune having like auto or micro or macro angiopathic, right? Am I dealing with like uh, a heart valve that as the blood is passing through it that it's being destroyed? Or am I dealing with uh, thrombosis all over all over the body and that causes the uh, red blood cells to pass through it and get injured and damaged? That's those are the questions that you need to ask yourself. Uh, next is let's take a look now at the microcytic type of chronic anemia. Your microcytic anemia is like we said, iron deficiency, thalassemia lead poisoning, and anemia of, of, uh, of, uh, anemia of chronic infection, or chronic disease, is that what it's called, chronic disease, where did it go? Yeah, anemia of chronic disease. So, uh, lead poisoning. What's up? Good, I'm just doing a, a gigantic video about every communication up with you. Okay, we'll watch it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, where you have protoporphyrin gets turned into heme using an enzyme called furocalotin. And this requires iron. So you can imagine two things here that, have, that are aware of lead poisoning is going to have an effect. Lead poisoning is going to stop heme synthesis on two levels. 
through inhibition of ALA dehydrogenase and inhibition of furosilase. So if I ask you what's going to happen with lead, uh, lead poisoning, what are you going to have? So remember, if I'm stopping an enzyme, I'm going to have an increase in all of its precursors or all of the substrate. So you're going to have an increase in ALA and an increase in product of firing. So let's take a look at uh, lead, uh, lead poisoning and see if I am correct in my thinking. Okay. All right. So here we have lead poisoning. We said already the two enzymes, ALA dehydratase and furokilotase. So I'm going to have the glycine synthesis overall, okay? But um, you're also going to have your increased levels of, they don't mention it here, your increased levels of those two curses. You're also going to have um, increased RBC, so they do mention it. So they have increased RBC protocol firing and they and the symptoms are going to be clear. The lead lines on the gingiva, so these are the virgin lines. Because it's important to like see these things. Uh, don't rely on memorizing. Like, the easiest way to memorize is just to look at it. So we have the virtual. So virtual lines or virtual lines. Virtual lines. Okay. So you're gonna have this lead. It's gonna precipitate along the lung, uh, the the gingiva of your your gums. So it looks like that. So let me just start. Uh, zoom in. Okay, well, we can see that clearly here. So you have your gingiva here. You're also going to have it, um, the lead is also going to precipitate along the bones. So you have your lead lines on the gingiva and in the metathesis of the lung bone on x-rays over here. You're also going to have encephalopathy and abdominal colic and drops of the wrist and foot. So that's important. Who's going to come up to you with this lead poisoning? Essentially, you want to look for a child who is eating paint chips. So that's important. I'm going to write this down. Please don't forget it. Paint chips. So some child living in a house that's really old, before like the 1970s or 1960s, and uh, they were eating paint chips. So um, that's going to happen. So you're going to have uh, lead poisoning in my kidney anemia. And the other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, uh, we'll mention it with iron deficiency anemia, so we don't forget it there. You have paint chips, uh, and then you're also going to have some metal worker. So those are generally the two clinical vignettes you're going to have. A metal worker or a child eating paint chips in a house that's really old before the 1930s, 1960s. Uh, that was when they made it illegal to have lead or certain levels of lead within the paint that they painted houses with. Uh, then you're going to have these neurological manifestations. Don't forget, anemia plus neurological manifestations. Uh, encephalopathy and erythrocyte based epileptic and abdominal pain uh, and microscopic anemia that looks like lead poisoning, along with these key features of the person line and the lead precipitating along the metaphysis. What do we treat it with? It's ADCA and dimorcaparol. Again, like they say here, increase in old houses with chip pain in children or workplace adults. Next is the sideroblastic anemia. So this is either genetic or acquired condition where you have a defective ALA synthase gene or it can be acquired uh, through myelodysplastic syndromes or alcohol is the most common. That's very important. Alcohol can cause, can cause microcytic anemia like you see here through sideroblastic anemia or it can cause microcytic anemia of the non type, um, which we'll see with the um, which we'll see with that discussion. Or it can occur with certain drugs like isoniazid or linozolid. Also, lead poisoning can show sideroblastic anemia because it increases peak. So, think about this. It's a lot easier to look at it um, through the chart and the figure that we have. So, if I'm not using my uh, iron to make the heat because the are stuff by lead poisoning, I have iron. 
that's going to be increased in my circulation, and that's going to go to the bone marrow, it's going to go to other places, so you're going to have uh, this increased iron or cigarette blocks in the that's why it's like poisoning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So here's an appearance of what my percentage of being looks like. Um, I'm just going to zoom out because I feel like there's something missing here. Okay, yes, is there something that's the other three pages, uh, the other three topics of microcytic hyperchromocanemia, uh, so I was wondering where the iron deficiency go. So, um, let's talk about iron deficiency. Iron deficiency, basic foundations of uh, anemia that you need to know, it's due to decreased iron, and the most common cause is essentially due to decreased uh, due to chronic so That can be through GI loss, like somebody who has cancer. Uh, and they're losing it through there, or they have some kind of infection or a parasite uh, that's causing bleeding. That's important to know. Or just through menstruation, women have the highest place of iron to go through as a result. Or malnutrition or absorption disorders or GI surgery like the gastrectomy. Or increased demand for expectancy, which is also important. Is the uh, decreased final sex of these Remember, we that iron for that period. And the both functioning in order to be produced key. So your last one going to be decreased iron, that's important. So if I have decreased iron, I also have decreased stores. So decreased stores is decreased ferritin. Increased RDW is important to keep in mind here. That helps to differentiate iron deficiency anemia from other types of microcritic anemia. And increase the IBC. So your symptoms are going to be the usual symptoms of anemia that we know of. The fatigue, the pallor, you're very tired, you're very pale. Um, one such thing you need to be aware of is PICA. Pica is persistent craving and impulse of eating non-food substances. And this is what I want to talk about with iron deficiency anemia. So you're going to have someone who's eating things that are non-nutritious, right? So they're either eating like sand, or they're eating dirt, or they're eating uh, in a playground where there is like those wood chips, they're probably eating that. But they can also be eating plant chips too. So you, the pica can cause two types of anemia, or could be a clue to two types of anemia that are going on. They have iron deficiency anemia, and they can also have symptoms of blood poisoning. The pike has triggered them to be anxious, for example. That's what's something to keep in mind. You have your spoon of nails, which is the splitting of the nails without appearing. I don't think they have a picture there for you. And they have um, other manifestations. They have something here that's called tumor vincent syndrome. So this is a triad of three things iron deficiency anemia in a woman and uh, esophageal webs and dysphagia. You're going to get the dysphagia from the esophageal webs. The key thing to know is that tumor vincent syndrome is pre cancerous. So let's write that down so that you remember that. In the precancerous lesions. Next is your alpha calcium and beta calcium. So these are very important and very interesting. And it's better to just understand it uh, so that you don't forget. So you have your alpha calcium and beta calcium. Remember we said that alpha and beta are the two that's needed for adult hemoglobin. So you have beta calcium here. Uh, we need that beta to be developed at six months, correct? So we're going to have symptoms at six months if I have a beta thalassemia. But I'm going to have symptoms very early on and even in the fetus from alpha thalassemia because remember, HBF has two alpha as well. So this guy is not limited by any time frame. Your yeah, beta thalassemia is. So let's take a look at what's, what's going on here. So you have uh, alpha thalassemia is due to a gene deletion. That's important to know. So it's a gene deletion. Well, this one is a point mutation and splice site. Okay? So this is an issue with something called SMURFs. We're going to get this question. It's an issue with but this one is a uh, gene deletion on chromosome 16. You need to remember this is chromosome 16. This one is chromosome 11. Look, uh, I love writing just big uh, text so that I remember everything and I don't forget the, uh, the just these little factoids where you can really just lose marks over something so silly, ignoring the number of chromosomes that the pathology is on. So, how can I explain this to you in a way that's simple? So you have two copies on chromosome uh, 16 of each uh, for the alpha thalassemia, and you have two chromosomes, correct? You're actually going to deal with four, correct? So either I have one of these is missing, okay? If one of these is missing, I still have this additional copy on the other chromosome, so I'm not going to have any anemia. So we call that a silent carrier, okay? That's alpha thalassemia minima. Okay, now let's talk about if I have two deletions. Two deletions. So either I have two deletions, either one, this one is deleted. 
see if this works. Come on. Okay. So either I have deleted one and once. Uh, in that case, I still have another one and another one. Correct? So we call that, if it's on the same side, remember, one way to remember this is sisters are supposed to be on the same side. So if I have this one got deleted, and this one got deleted, so this is a deletion on one chromosome, and on another chromosome, they're not on the same side. We call that a trans deletion. But if I have this, both of these are deleted. I still have the other two, which can compensate, right? Uh, so effectively, I don't really have a very major anemia. I have a mild microcytic hyperchromic anemia. But which one is worse? The one that's worse is just deletion, because both of these are going to be deleted. That means while well, I only have a mild anemia, if I have a child, I'm only I'm going to be passing them on uh, a worse outcome essentially, because they don't they only have these two problems. If they have any other issue, they're going to have a major anemia. That's how, uh, that's how to see this. So you have a cyst deletion may worsen the outcome for the previous offspring. So let's just say that one more time so that uh, uh, it is more clear for you and so that we memorize this together. So you have two copies here, here, and here, here. So if I remove both of these, I'm not going to have a major anemia because I still have two copies on another chromosome. Okay, that is cyst deletion two deletions on the same side. So sisters are on the same side. So that's fine. I'm still going to have a mild anemia, but the main issue is with my child, uh, where I'm going to pass them off a worse outcome. The other one is a trans deletion, where I have deleted, well, one here, it could be this one and this one, or this one or this one. It's not as bad, uh, because I still have copies on both of the chromosomes. This is alpha that came out minor, minor, either trans or cis. And this is going to have a mild, uh, a mild microcytic hypochromic anemia. That's alpha galactic Now, things get ugly with a third deletion. Okay? The third deletion means something's missing. Uh, and I don't have another copy anywhere for me to make up for it. So, uh, normally you would have one, two, one, two. And now this one's gone, and this one's gone, and this one's gone. I only have one. So we call that HBH disease. Right? And to compensate, what ends up happening is excess beta globulins form. And so they have increased before to make up for this. So you're going to have a moderate to severe microcytic anemia. Any way you look at it, I'm not going to have enough alpha D because I have three deletions, three deletions right now. The last but not least, and the most dangerous one is hemoglobin BART. Hemoglobin BART, I have nothing. I have no alpha being formed. And I always say, always remember your embryology. Remember, I need alpha for HBF to develop. If I don't have alpha even for HBF because I have four deletions here in hemoglobin BART disease, no, actually no alpha globulin is being formed. I'm only going to have the excess gamma globulin form, which gamma, remember, makes the other two parts of the hemoglobin F. So gamma is going to be, you're going to have increased gamma here and beta here. And this is the worst. You're going to have a severe type of anemia. We call hydroxychitalic. It's absolutely incompatible with life. I need alpha for uh, adult hemoglobin. I need alpha for adult hemoglobin. So I don't have that here. So this is the worst one. It's HB bar now, beta housing is a lot less complicated because I'm only dealing with point mutation on one copy of chromosome 11. So chromosome 11 here. And either I have one gone and I still have another, we call that beta thalassemia minor, or I have both gone and we call that beta thalassemia major. So remember, I don't, I, I need alpha absolutely for HBF and HBA, right? But HBA is only developed at six months. So I start to have symptoms at six months. So let's see what it says here. Beta thalassemia minor is a heterozygote. They have beta chain is underproduced. Underproduced. You still have one uh, copy there uh, of that uh, of this gene, uh, but one of them is gone. So you're gonna have a mild anemia as well. As a as a reaction, you're gonna have an increase in HBA2. So whenever you have HBA2, this is the most valuable thing you can remember. HBA2, all your crops are going to go to thalassemia. So you're going to have HBA2 more than 3.5% on electrophoresis, thanks to beta thalassemia. Beta thalassemia major because we have a, uh, a splice site mutation on both sides, so these two are missing. So the beta chain is absolutely intact, but I need my beta chain 
for HBA. So you're going to have a severe microcytic hypochromic anemia with target cells. Remember, we said target cells appear in many, many places. Asclenia and beta thalassemia, if you remember. And increase a nine soap, whatever, however, however you want to say that. Requiring blood transfusion. If I have a severe, I have a severe anemia, I will transfuse blood often to these patients. If you transfuse blood, you have a major problem. So you're going to have iron overload and you're going to have hemochromatosis. Uh, that's another problem that these people have to face and deal with. Marrow expansion on cool cuts. You have anemia, right? The bone marrow is not producing the correct type, so I'm going to trigger. Um, the reproocyte formation in other areas, such as the bones. So you're going to have marrow expansion on x ray, you're going to have skeletal, skeletal deformities in chipmunk faces, next on the dollar, you're going to have a you're going to have a title you're going to have increased risk of parovirus and these uh, aplastic crisis. Please do not make the mistake of confusing aplastic crisis with aplastic anemia. Aplastic crisis targets RBC, aplastic anemia targets all three cell types, where you're going to have decreased RBCs, decreased white blood cells, and decreased platelets. Do not make that mistake. You're going to have increased HBF, so the body has to adapt, right? So I'm going to adapt by making the only hemoglobin that I can make safely, which is HBF, right? So HBF is alpha-2 gamma-2. We're going to have increased HBF, we're going to have increased HBA2, which is alpha-2 delta-2. So I'm going to have these bizarre types of um, these bizarre types of hemoglobin on my hemoglobin electrophoresis. I'm going to see HBF and HBA2. I'm going to know HBA, the normal one. So now I know I'm dealing with the beta, with the beta fallacy. Remember, this is a very tricky question here. This alpha uh, HBS and beta thalassemia subtype. So remember, don't get that intimidated. You're going to have HBS and both beta thalassemia. So you're going to have HBA2, you're going to have HBF, you're also going to have HBS on your electrophoresis. Uh, we said here the lead poisoning, we've already done that, we've already done the pseudoblastic anemia. How do we interpret the study? So this is very simple. Oh, just think about it, just think about it. Iron deficiency, you're going to have decreased iron, correct? You're going to have decreased stores. So your ferritin is going to be decreased, but your transparent binding capacity doesn't apply. It was there, it wants to bind to the iron, but it can't. So the binding capacity is going to be elevated, that's there. Anemia of Crohn's disease is a very interesting type of uh, anemia where you have an underlying in, uh, condition where you're going to have increased something called hepcidin. So hepcidin is going to increase, right? So as well as something called ferritin. So the important thing about ferritin, that only does it denote the iron uh, uh, condition. It's also known as a uh, APC. So uh, that's going to be elevated, and then you're going to have decreased iron and decreased stores. It's going to be uh, elevated. The ferritin is going to be elevated. Here. That's the one that's different. Okay. 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 Iron overload. So I'm going to have high iron. Right? We're not dealing with an anemia here. We're going to have high iron. I fear it. And high TI could be very, very high TI. Next is your macrocytic anemia, and these are very, very high yield to know, uh, especially when it's not actually the most common type, because they can trick you uh, on these questions. So we're going to get through that right now. The so macrocytic anemia should have an MCD of more than 100. So these are not megaloblastic anemia, they're huge. Megaloblastic anemia, very long words, it's very huge. So you have a uh, uh, key findings are going to be you have impaired DNA synthesis. I want to give it some kind of Frankenstein cell. Impaired DNA synthesis, so very large, very strange looking. So you have this uh, megaloblastic anemia here. Impaired DNA synthesis, maturation of the precursors in Romeo. Delayed relative to maturation of cytoplasm. It's a very large cell. You have many, many causes to the use of vitamin D12 deficiency, folate deficiency, and certain medications. Potent smell, hydroxyurea, phenytoin. I'm going to highlight these like hydroxyurea, phenytoin, methotrexate, sulfur drugs can all give you the from the yellow box. Um, RBC macrocytosis and hypersegmented neutrophils. Remember, we've already said that you're going to have a uh, neutrophil with many, many lobes, more than six. So let's count what we have here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight segmentations here. So that is the hypersegmented neutrophils. We don't have the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency in the blood cycle. The folate deficiency of vitamin B12 deficiency. The key thing is to differentiate between them. So we have a peripheral blood smear and we're seeing megaloblastic anemia. So both of them have very similar backgrounds as to why they would happen. And they look very similar on peripheral blood smear. The key thing is how to differentiate them. Like you're going to get to that right there. And folate deficiency, you're going to have increased homocysteine and normal methylmalonic acid. And vitamin B12 deficiency, you're going to have increased homocysteine and increased methylmalonic acid. So that is the most important thing to know. In this whole video, all you need to know is that increase in acid is human vitamin B12 deficiency. This is normal, so increase H, 
uh, and normal metamalonic acid should have had increased homocysteine and increased metamalonic acid here. That is the key word to know. We, we can discuss that uh, right now. But let's take a look quickly at the folate efficiency. What are the causes of malnutrition, especially chronic alcohol overuse? You're going to get a patient who's a, a homeless person and they are uh, you know, drinking a lot and they might come in. Uh, with a folate deficiency or vitamin C deficiency. Again, like I said, it's very hard to differentiate from only biochemically would you be able to do that. There's another picture of vitamin C deficiency that you need to know that it has neurologic symptoms. That's very important. It has these neurologic symptoms. And the problem with the neurologic symptoms is you might think you're only dealing with folate deficiency or vitamin B12, but if you treat the folate deficiency, uh, if you give them folate, you'll treat the anemia, but you won't treat the neurologic manifestation. So that's a huge problem here. The reversible dementia, you have subacute combined degeneration due to involvement of B12 in the fatty acid pathways, right? So you're going to have both issues with the spinal cerebellar tract and the lateral cardiac spinal tract. Uh, and then the thing is, this, the folate supplementation will cure the anemia, but it will not, it will worsen the neurological symptoms because vitamin B12 is needed uh, in vulvar myeloma synthesis. What are the causes of vitamin B12 deficiency? You're going to have pernicious anemia. Remember, that is uh, antibodies against the intrinsic factor, and uh, this tends to happen in older women where you're going to have this vitamin B12 deficiency. Malabsorption, chronic disease, pancreatic insufficiency, gastrectomy, insufficient intake, like vegans, uh, dexobacillin, and parasites. Remember, you might have eosinophilia, right, and megaloblastigidemia. If I tell you eosinophilia plus megaloblastigidemia, in a patient from some third world country, uh, you're not going to say that on your deficiency. You have to address this to kill you here. Likely that Kavasa lacks on which competes with vitamin B12 for absorption in the GI tract, and then you're going to have your um, megaloblastic anemia because vitamin B12 is not being absorbed. So that's another reason to keep in mind in the uh, with this vitamin B12. Those are two buzzwords together. Historically, it was diagnosed with a shilling test. I've never seen a question on this before. And in your secondary it can take several years. So the body actually stores vitamin B12 for a very long time as compared to with the uh, folate deficiency, which I believe is several weeks. Um, and that is what makes the brain change, two of them. So like we said, neurological moment, neurological manifestation, increased homocysteine and release of the body acid uh, is what we're going to need to determine the vitamin B12. Now here is the root of the trick. So what if you get megaloblastic anemia? And you look, it looks pretty normal to you. Right? But you have, you've given them this medication, like you're, you're going to cover your tissue. Assume that it's vitamin B12 deficiency so that you don't miss the neurological tissue. Uh, so you get folate and vitamin B12, but the person still has anemia. The anemia is going to change after several weeks of therapy. What are you going to look at? You know, it's going to be called erotic acid. So this is an ability to convert erotic acid, UMP, due to a defective in the synthesis. You remember all the way from biochemistry to the very beginning, there is remedy. A purine synthesis, or maybe it's just a whole here. It's an autosomal recessive condition. Uh, and essentially, you're just going to get a, a failure to thrive and developmental delay and a megaloblastic anemia that is refractory to folate and vitamin B12 deficiency with no hyperammonia. So you're going to have normal, uh, no ammonia in the blood, and you're going to have the megaloblastic anemia, and you gave them vitamin B12 and uh, folate, and they still have no control. Then you would say it's erotic acid urea. They might ask you what is the defect here, and you want to know that it's an ability to convert erotic acid urea to UMP. So increased erotic, erotic acid as a result. So if this is not being formed, I'm going to have an increase in the substrate. So you're going to have increased erotic, uh, erotic acid, and you're going to have normal, uh, no hyperammonemia to differentiate it with another condition called ornithine transcarbonylase deficiency, where you would have. Hyperammonemia. So erotic acid is going to be found in the urine, and the treatment for that is going to be urine monophosphate. I have to supplement this guy so that I can continue into the pathway normally and bypass this defect here. Next are the non megaloblastic anemia. So they are microcytic but without the megaloblast. So the DNA synthesis is normal. The important thing to keep in mind is chronic alcohol overuse. Remember, we said chronic alcohol overuse is called microcytic, and now it can also cause non megaloblastic anemia. It's something called diamond black cat anemia. This is a congenital form of pure red cell aplasia. Pure red cell aplasia versus pancone anemia, which causes cancer. If you non differentiate this back from pancone anemia, which has decreased in all three cell types. And this is generally just a pure, less pure red cell. 
we're gonna decrease our blood flow to your heart. We're gonna have increase in HPS, short stature, cranial facial abnormalities, and we're gonna have some. The only blood work here is the triphalangeal function of the tissue set up. Normal sedic normal chromatinemia is said are gonna be either intravascular or extravascular. Remember, intravascular is either some issue uh, within the uh, Within the the uh, cell itself, wait, sorry, that's that's a, uh, that's a different topic. So you have normal cytic, normal chromic anemia. So you have your uh, yes, yeah, so the cause is either non-hemolytic or hemolytic. The hemolytic anemias are further classified according to the laws, like you said, yes, the laws of the and all the locations of the intravascular and extravascular. So intravascular, you're going to have decreased haploglobulin and increased histocytes in the bloodstream. Uh, remember, those are the helmet cells that you're going to find where the RBCs are passing through a valve or passing through a uh, blood clot and getting injured, and now you have these uh, helmet cells that are histocytes. Extravascular hemolysis is occurring uh, within the spleen. That's important. So as a result, you're going to have some type of spleen battle, spleen and spleen and spleen. Findings are going to be spherocytes in the peripheral blood stream. This is mostly found in spherocytes, which is an autoimmune blood stream. This is important because they might ask you what type of hemolysis is happening. It's an extra vascular hemolysis uh, that's happening with uh, hereditary spherocytosis and autoimmune blood So now you have your non hemolytic normal state of anemia. The reason they have anemia of chronic disease here, like we said, is that sometimes they can occur first as a non hemolytic normal state, but then eventually it will actually end up being microcytic anemia. So you have a condition that's called inflammation. That inflammation is going to create something called hepatitis. The key thing to remember is that in iron, physiology is we don't have a way to, we only have a way to control receiving iron in our body. So that is done through hepcidin. Increased hepcidin is going to decrease relief of iron from the microphages and decrease absorption of iron. The only way for us to maintain iron homo uh, homeostasis is to either increase its absorption or decrease its absorption of iron. So hepcidin is going to come, right, and you have your, um, you know, you have iron being absorbed from the gut. Hepcidin is going to come in and it's going to block that from happening. So you're going to have decreased iron absorption from the gut uh, and decreased iron being released from the macrophages. So iron is going to build up within the cells and it's not going to be absorbed from the gut. And this is due to some underlying inflammation that's causing an increase in interleukin 6 that's causing that increase in hepcidin. So don't forget, hepcidin is the reason why you're getting this iron, anemia of chronic disease. Therefore, the only way to really treat anemia of chronic disease is to treat the underlying cause of the inflammation. What are the causes? It can be something like systemic lupus, erythematosis, or rheumatoid arthritis, other conditions like chronic kidney disease, chronic infections, so I need to treat these guys as long as they are there and they have this inflammation, this increase in pollutant 6, you're going to have this increased hepcidin and decreased iron absorption and increased iron, uh, decreased iron release from the macrophages. So what is that going to look like on your picture? You're going to have decreased iron overall because I'm increasing my iron absorption from the gut. You're going to have increased ferritin because my stores are full of iron. I'm not letting go of them, right? We're not letting go of iron from the macrophages. So the stores are full, but also because ferritin is also another uh, inflammation marker of inflammation. That's one thing to keep in mind. Ferritin is a marker of inflammation. You're going to have decreased IBC. It is normal acidic, but eventually it becomes microcytic. Treatment is to address the underlying cause of the inflammation and reduce the use of blood transfusion, considering the use of the system hitting agent. Next is your aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is very easy to understand. It is a failure or destruction of hematopoietic cells. Aplastic anemia we're dealing with three cell types. You have RBCs that are decreased. If your white blood cells are decreased, you have your platelets that are decreased. What are the reasons for this to happen? Number one is radiation. Number two is viral agents. So some of these have specific predilection to RBCs, your white blood cells, or platelets. SMR virus, HIV, hepatitis virus, very important. Keep in mind. Fanconi anemia causes a uh, cancer of kidneys, a total bone marrow failure. Idiopathic, it can be idiopathic, the most common reason is idiopathic, actually, uh, but it's believed to be immune mediated. Drugs like benzene and chloramphenicol can cause this as well. We're going to have decreased reticulocyte count and, decreased, and increased EPO as a result. That's important. Cancer of is characterized by anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. What does that look like? You're going to have patient has anemia. The patient is going to have your palate. You're going to have your fatigue. Your white blood cell deficiencies is going to be increased infections, right, and fever. Or you're going to have, um, no, sorry, not fever. Or decreased platelets, you're going to have bleeding, increased bleeding time. So all three of these things must be there for you to consider aplastic anemia. You're going to have normal cell morphology. There's nothing wrong with them, but you're going to have a hypocellular bone marrow. That's very important. Hypocellular bone marrow and fatty infiltration. So if you do a bone tap, it's going to be dry. Dry bone tap is very important. Dry bone tap, and if I look at it, I can see there's empty here, and there's fat cells. All I have is fat cells. 
the milk cell to select a positive treatment, withdraw the offending agent, right? It could be a drug that I'm giving them that's obvious. So withdraw the offending agent. Immunosuppressive regimens, because we said if it's the most common drug that is idiopathic, so immune suppressive regimen might be the treatment for it. Um, bone marrow allograft, give platelets and RBC transfusions as needed. Next is your intrinsic colloidal communion. This is also very important. Remember, we said intrinsic is due to something intrinsic within the RBC itself. Either it's an issue of the membrane, an issue of the enzymes within it, or an issue of the hemoglobin that's within it. Either an issue with the hemoglobin, an issue with the enzymes, or an issue with the membrane. Let's start with the membrane. Hereditary serocytosis is autosomal dominant. It's important to know that it is autosomal dominant. Due to a defect in proteins interacting with RBC membranes. The defect of proteins are in chiron, band 3, protein 4.2, and spectrum. So you're going to get these small spherocytes. Remember, we have biconcave appearance. So you're going to get these small, very sphere looking. You're not going to have that traditional appearance that you see that kind of looks like a target cell. You're not going to have that. You're just going to have this red uh, small cell right here. That's the uh, hereditary spherocytosis. So what ends up happening is that these are prematurely removed by the spleen. So there's an extravascular hemolysis. Not put that here. Extravascular hemolysis. They get removed by the spleen. They get destroyed. You're going to have hemoglobin that ends up causing gallstones. This is very important. So you're going to have splenomegaly. Because it all go into the spleen and the tries to destroy all of them. When it gets destroyed, you're going to have hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is going to go and cause pigmented all cells and aplastic crisis, which is a parvovirus uh, B19 infection. Remember, aplastic crisis specifically to the RBC. You're going to have a couple of tests to figure this out. You want to see a decreased mean fluorescence in RBC on EMA, so you're going to have decreased EMA test, binding test, increased osmotic fragility, and please don't forget, because this is always a trick question, negative two. And I can tell you, you have a patient with an anemia, and it's an extrinsic anemia, right? It's an extra, extra vascular anemia, and then you're going to have a negative pain test, an increased osmotic, and a positive pain test, and uh, increased osmotic fragility. We need to know that the positive pain test means it's on a negative pain test is going to be hereditary spherocytosis, and that is where they get tricky. So please don't make that mistake. Negative pain test is very important here for hereditary spherocytosis. G6PD deficiency is excellent recessive, that's important. So you have the mother is going to give to her son. G6PD defect, you're going to have decreased NADPA, reduced glutathione, and meaning at the end of the day is that these red blood cells are uh, susceptible to oxidation, so they get destroyed very easily to oxidative stresses, like sulfur drugs, if someone has an infection and they gave them sulfur drugs, uh, or antimalarial, like hydroxychloroquine, or chloroquine, or quality, so all these things are actually the small. So the most an extravascular and extravascular hemolysis, you're going to have the symptoms of back pain. Why do we get back pain? That's very important. Why do we get back pain or bone pain? What is hemolytic anemia? When you have hemoglobin that's being released now that you know, I have an RBC and uh, the spleen has now eaten it and I have the hemoglobin being released, so what ends up happening is hemoglobin actually binds to nitrous oxide. And that binding leads to and causes muscular spasms. Remember, nitrous oxide is vasodilates and it relaxes the muscle. So if that's not available, you're going to have these muscles that's bad. So that's how you get the back pain. That's how you do the back pain. You just have deficiency in uh, sickle cell as well. You're going to have hemoglobinuria uh, a couple days after the oxidative stress. You're going to have a child, they got sick, the mother gave them whatever antibiotic, and then they have the jaundice or hemoglobinuria. G6PD deficiency. The labs are going to show, remember, we said we have the hinds, we have the denatured hemoglobin here. That's your uh, hind body. The skin came out and it took a bite out of it. You're going to have your bite cells, the hind body bite cells. Next, pyruvate kinase deficiency. So, number one, enzyme deficiency is G6PD. Number two is pyruvate kinase deficiency. Pyruvate kinase defect is going to cause a decrease in ATP. So, these RBCs are now more rigid. You need ATP to maintain that biconcave. Uh, Appearance. So these things are going to be more, these RBCs are going to be more uh, susceptible to damage as well. So extravascular hemolysis and increased levels of T3DPG, that is the for pyruvate kinase deficiency. Increased T3DPG. Because you have increased T3DPG, remember, uh, increased T3DPG means you have decreased affinity for oxygen. Remember that 2,3-DPG, when it binds to the, between the, the two beta globulins, that's where it binds, it binds between the two beta globulins. 
what's going to happen is you're going to have a uh, relaxed form that like goes with oxygen, right? So therefore you have a decreased affinity to uh, oxygen. Hemolytic anemia in a newborn, and you're going to have those burr cells, don't forget about that. Sparatus of a maternal hemoglobin, you know, very simply, you have these, uh, these receptors here uh, where uh, they will protect the RBC from activation by constant complement at any time and attack your RBC, but that never happens because you have these things that are protecting your RBCs. So you have these, uh, so these are called GP1 anchor synthesis. You have CD55 and CD59. These CD55 and CD59, they're normally there and they protect your RBCs from destruction by complement. If they're not there, you're going to have a complement destruction of RBCs. So you have an increased complement mediated intravascular hemolysis. So it's due to something called a PIGA uh, or PIGA mutation, so it's a PIGA mutation here, acquired PIGA mutation. So, you, so now your RBCs are susceptible to damage by these, uh, by, by complement, and these normally protect the RBC from that disruption. You're going to have a triad of Bloom's negative hemolytic anemia, pancytopenia, and venous thrombosis. You have to memorize this. Bloom's negative uh, hemolytic anemia, pancytopenia, and venous thrombosis. The thrombosis might clue you in that you're dealing with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin. You're going to get a patient, she goes to the bathroom in the morning, and she sees that she's paying bread, okay, and it's hemoglobinuria. And you find out that she has a venous thrombus in a weird place. Spontary syndrome is venous thrombosis and hepatic veins. Superior mesenteric vein thrombosis. That might also clue you in on paroxysmal nocturnal uh, hemoglobinuria. So let's just write that down so you don't forget. You want to look at thrombosis? in a weird place. That might clue you in on proximal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So pink red urine in the morning associated with aplastic anemia. Don't forget you have a pancytopenia here. And acute leukemias. Labs, you're going to find decreased CD55 and 59. So just write somewhere like the big numbers that you need to know, like the, the buzzwords. You don't forget them. 55, 59 on flow cytometry. The treatment is something called eclusimab. So eclusimab prevents the complement cascade. Okay, now the problem with eclusimab that we don't mention here is that eclusimab, you must give prophylaxis for Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, so you want to give uh, uh, meningitis vaccine, make sure they're vaccinated. Because uh, if you remember, uh, people who have defects in that terminal complement, they are at increased risk of infection from meningitis. So don't forget that that's an important thing to keep in mind. Next is sickle cell anemia. This is a point mutation on beta globulin genes. So we're going to go from G to... B, remember G was negative, valine is neutral, so we can determine that by electrophoresis. You have glutamic acid to valine, a mutant HBA is termed HBS, it causes extravascular and intravascular hemolysis. So you have a lot of things that can trigger the sickling to occur. You have low oxygen, high altitude, acidosis, and dehydration, do not forget dehydration. So you're going to get anemia and vaso What ends up happening? You have these skinny little sickle cells, and what ends up happening here is you have your RBC, and it ends up developing a pocket on the beta, and then it kind of looks like a puzzle piece where all of them are going to start to fit into each other. So you're going to get this um, basal occlusive uh, disease, this basal occlusive pathology that's going to happen. So you're going to have this basal occlusion that's happening all over the body. It can happen in the spleen, you're going to become functionally insulin, you can happen in the brain, and you're going to have uh, infarctions there, and you can have heart attacks, you can go to the bones cause swelling in the hands of people. So we're going to see all of these pathologies here with sickle cell. So the newborns are initially asymptomatic because HDS is increased more than HDS. And what is the reason for that? We said that before, 2,3-BPG is decreased in HDS. And 2,3-BPG, if it's decreased, means I have increased affinity to oxygen. So HDS is resistant to hypoxia, which is one of the triggers for sickle. So at zero zygotes, you have sickle cell traits. So some people have a trait, so they don't have both um, you point the on both chromosomes, you're going to have, on both genes, you're going to have two only at once. You're just a heterozygote. So they have some resistance to malaria, and we're going to discuss that right now. If you take a look at where malaria is endemic, uh, malaria here we can see is endemic in primarily African countries and other parts of Southeast Asia and uh, South America here. So, what is going on with malaria? So let's get this out of the way. It is believed in um, evolution. 
right? That some people have, to, we have, we may have evolved to go sell trade as well as G6PD, so please don't forget that. Both G6PD and um, sickle cell have some resistance to malaria. So sickle cell trait, right? So sickle cell disease is two S's are, is, is um, pathologies on both. So you're gonna have more severe disease. A sickle cell trait in G6PD, so what's going on here? Remember that malaria has a part of its life cycle within the RBC. So it has to have some problem with the RBC uh, lifespan, which is almost 120 days, right? Um, I'm gonna have a problem with me, with the with the malaria uh, modium or calciparum for completing its life cycle. So what's going on with sickle cell? Let's understand that. With sickle cell, you're gonna have your sickling, which is gonna happen. The lifespan for sickle cell trait is a little bit less than normal, so we're not gonna be able to complete that 120 days. So I'm not able to complete the 120 days lifespan, so the malaria is not able to complete its lifespan uh, fully, so uh, they have some resistance to malaria infection. What's happened to G6PD deficiency? These people have uh, increased oxidants or, uh, or oxidation, very susceptible to oxidation. So not only do they also have a hemolysis, but it turns out that malaria, the plasmodium falciparum, also has a uh, susceptibility to oxygen. Uh, it's, it's very sensitive to oxygen. So that um, those oxygen radicals that end up building up in people who have G6PD uh, are also protected from malaria because these oxygen radicals damage the pathological calciparum and injure it and are not able to complete the life cycle. So in both cases, it's either a decrease in the uh, lifespan or uh, an exposure to these oxygen radicals, which the plasmodium calciparum is very sensitive to. So that's that. Uh, most common autosomal recessive in the black population. Uh, what are you going to have? We have a on X-ray due to narrow expansion. We know that. Then we have complications uh, of sickle cells. These are very, very highly and very important. And number one is a plastic crisis. Again, crisis is specific to the RBCs. Due to parvovirus B19. You have autosplenectomy and how will jolly bodies? Don't forget that how will how will jolly bodies? Plus, the target cells are what you see in splenectomy. So what ends up happening is you have these micro infarctions that keep happening in the spleen until the spleen is going to undergo autosplenectomy. When you don't have a spleen, you're having increased risk of infection by encapsulated organisms like tropical You're going to have splenic infarction or sequestration crisis. What is that? Where suddenly the spleen starts to become very, very full and congested of RBCs. So that's the sequestration crisis. You have salmonella osteomyelitis. For some reason, they have increased transmission to salmonella because salmonella is also encapsulated, I believe. Painful vasoobtrusive crisis, which is dactylitis. Again, you're going to have micro infarctions in the hands and feet. So you're going to have uh, swelling of the hands and feet. But you're also going to have vasoobtrusive crisis that happens in the penis. So that's a priapism, which is a painful, prolonged erection. You're going to have acute chest syndrome. Acute chest syndrome is a crazy example of a vicious cycle. So what's going to happen? You said hypoxia. Right, is going to trigger sickling. So that sickling is going to cause vaginal occlusive disease. That vaginal occlusive disease is going to go to the pulmonary circulation, and then you're going to have vaginal occlusion there, and then you're going to have more hypoxia, and then you've just triggered this whole cycle over again. So you're going to have a vicious cycle here of hypoxia, vaginal occlusion, hypoxia. So this is a very dangerous uh, complication of sickle cell disease. Uh, the one way to diagnose it is new pulmonary infiltrate on chest x-ray. And there's a common cause of that, very dangerous. You might need to do uh, like uh, blood, very large blood transfusions to fix this problem. Then you have sickling in the renal medulla. This is what happens mostly in traits. So if they ask you what is the problem with traits, sickle cell traits, you're going to worry about uh, about renal, uh, renal papillary necrosis and hematuria. Those are two things that will happen, as well as an increased risk in renal medullary carcinoma. Those are buzzwords for uh, people with trait. They have an increased risk of these problems. What will you see on hemoglobin electric group? I don't have any HB. A that's being formed properly. You're going to have your HBS is going to be elevated in HBF. Treatment is hydroxyurea. Remember, we said that before hydroxyurea. It's going to increase your hemoglobin F. Then you have uh, HBC disease. We mentioned HBC disease before. You're going to have glutamic uh, acid to lysine, and lysine, we said, was obviously the chart. You're going to have uh, crystals and target cells. You see crystals, target cells, lysine, that means HBC disease. Those are the factors you're about to explain. Next is um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Sometimes I worry that this thing is not recording. Okay. Next, we have your autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So for that, we have uh, two types. So you want acute positive anemia, you're going to say autoimmune, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You have two types. 
The warm or cold? Warm is IgG. Cold is IgM. Warm is seen in other conditions, SLE and CLL, during or other drugs, like alpha methyl gamma. Cold is IgM plus complement. And it's seen also in CLL, but it's also seen with mycoplasma immunity infection. The most important thing, please do not forget which, which type of immunoglobulin is called. So warm is G, so it's good to be warm. And then M is for cold. Okay? And mycoplasma immunity infection. They tend to ask this question, which type of infection would they have had? Uh, if they tell you some patient comes in with anemia after a mild case of uh, what looks like walking pneumonia, uh, what would have happened here, what type of, what's causing the anemia, or what type of immunoglobulin is going to be IgM, and it's cold water immunoglobulin anemia. Like we said a million times, you're going to get a serocytosis. So don't confuse this for regulatory serocytes. Don't rely purely on the factoids or the buzzwords. You see serocytes, and you're going to rush, and you're going to click hereditary serocytosis. Um, but if not, it's not, it's autoimmune anemia. Uh, warm, we treat that with steroids because remember the underlying issue is generally, generally in the immune one. You have here for both of them, but uh, SLE might be the cause or CLL or something about the next thing is refractory. Avoid the cold and cold autoimmune glutathione uh, and receptoreptible. So you have a cuxamab to both of the treatments. Your micro and macro angiopathic, we have already discussed this before. So as your RBC is passing through, the uh, blood vessel, there might be a clot that's there, and as it's passing through, it gets damaged. So you're going to get these fragments, which are the schistocytes. The schistocytes are seen in both here. Or you have a valve, so as the RBC is passing through a heart valve, uh, a prosthetic heart valve, or if you have aortic stenosis, and it's trying to squeeze through, uh, it's getting injured. Right? So then you're going to have your schistocytes in both here. You might also have people with anemia due to infection, so two types of infections are babesia and malaria. The buzzwords for it is you're going to have a ring-shaped form in the RBC, that's malaria, and babesia is called teeth cross. Okay, so here we have our heme synthesis and our porphyria. Again, lead poisoning. Lead poisoning here is high yield, and can be seen in a lot of uh, high yield areas here, multiple areas, so you want to know. Uh, the difference between the two. You want to understand what's happening here. So, we've already had lice poisoning. We're going to have increase in uh, activity of two enzymes. So, we have two enzymes that are affected. We've already said the ferrochelatase here and ALA dehydrogenase. So, we're going to use different colors here so we don't get confused. What is your accumulated substrate? So, if I'm stopping ALA dehydrogenase, I have increased ALA. If I'm stopping ferrochelatase, I have increased for the fire. So, let's go and make sure we answer that correctly. Increased protoporphyrin and ALA. What are you going to have a microcytic anemia with basal to sibling? Remember, you might also have a sideroblastic anemia. Ring sideroblast in the bone marrow, don't forget that. GI and kidney disease, children, exposure to lead, will lead to mental deterioration. Adults, it's probably like they're, due, they're working like at a metal factory or something, or batteries or ammunition, or they're also going to also have this neuropathy. So, you want to look for anything in your nervous system, infection plus anemia. You want to really think about what's losing here. I feel like you're so what's going on here? You really need to know the names of that, but there's no way out of it. There's no way out of it. So let's use a different color. If you intermittent bacteria, you have an issue with porphoral bilinogen deaminase. And you're going to have increase in porphoral bilinogen. Porphyria cutanea tarda. The name implies cutanea cutaneous symptoms. This one does not have cutaneous symptoms. You're going to have a defect in uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase. You're going to have an elevated level of uroporphyrinogen 3 and hydroxymethyl d -lane. So acute intermittent porphyria for fire by and D amnesis deficiency. You're going to have elevated for four by and AL8. So how can I treat this, right? I can just stop all of this from happening by preventing my rate limiting step of ALA symptoms, right? And I can do that by using glucose and semen, which work to prevent ALA synthase from working because these are needed as cofactors for ALA synthase. One way for me to treat AIP is to give glucose and semen. To prevent ALA from base, I've prevented ALA from being formed and I've prevented propyrobilinogen from being formed so that I don't have these two substrates from building up and causing the symptoms that you see. The symptoms are the five P's, very important to understand this. Painful abdomen, short wine colored tea, polyneuropathy, psychological disturbances, precipitated by anything that increases ALA symptoms. What increases ALA symptoms? 
alcohol and CYP450 inducers. Very important for what kind of drugs cause this. You might see a clinical vignette where somebody's taking some kind of medication and it triggers. Now, some of these drugs are used in the treatment of some psychiatric disease. I have a bigger problem because this looks like a psychiatric disease. So the problem with the treatment of intermittent mercurial is two things. You have psychiatric conditions, a psychiatric disorder. And you have a painful abdomen. You're going to have a clinical vignette with a patient. I'm going to write this down here. A patient who, who has frequent, frequent laughs, uh, where the findings, you don't have any findings. So they are frequently complaining about uh, abdominal pain and they're trying to find out what, what is the cause. Like it looks like an acute abdomen. They're looking to do all of these investigations. You've done CT, you've done MRI, you've done frequent labs, and you find nothing. Right? So if the patient is in pain, you've done your investigation, you find nothing. So then you assume they're psychic because they also have a background of psychiatric uh, or psychological disturbances. So you end up misdiagnosing the patient as a psychic case when in fact they have a psychological disturbance and acute uh, or abdominal pain, a very painful outcome, as a result of the acute intermittent period. Uh, so that's something that's very important and very high yield to be aware of. Uh, treatment, like we said, is team and so Let me just stop the ALA synthase from working completely. Next, you have your, um, let's take orange, Porphyria cutaneous arda. As the name implies, you have a cutaneous symptom here. Porphyria cutaneous arda is deficiency in your thyroid and decarboxylate. So what ends up happening is this guy is going to have to through porphyrin as a result. So you're going to get this tea colored urine. You're going to get a blistering cutaneous photosensitivity. You're going to get a patient who is out in the sun, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, and they have these uh, cutaneous blisters that develop on, them, on their skin. Uh, and then you're going to figure out eventually they might have polio or It is the most common bacteria, so that's important, so it's most common. And it's very high yield to be aware of, of the fact that it is associated with hepatitis C. So you're going to get a man who is, you know, drinking some alcohol and he spends like, a day in the sun and he has these cutaneous symptoms and he has a history of hepatitis C. What are you, what are you dealing with here? Superior cutaneous heart. Treatment is phlebotomy and sun avoidance and hydroxychloroquine. What is hydroxychloroquine doing to the uroporphyrinogen? It will bind with the uroporphyrinogen, uro all these porphyrins, into a water-soluble form that will be excreted in the urine. And then it doesn't build up in the skin and cause these symptoms. Next is iron poisoning. Iron poisoning can be acute or it could be chronic. Acute, you want to think of a child. Chronic, you want to think of someone who needs blood, like someone who has beta calcium. So acute has a high mortality rate and it's associated with accidental ingestion by children. Iron's tablets looks like candy. Liquid iron form tastes like chocolate, if you've ever tried it. It's like chocolate, it looks like candy. Uh, so it's very attractive for children to uh, drink it or eat it. Mechanism is, imagine putting iron, right? Iron is very oxidative. So you're going to get free radicals and peroxidation of membrane layers. So that's what you're dealing with here. Uh, damage to itself uh, due to oxidative stresses, peroxidation. You're going to get abdominal pain, GI bleeding. The key thing here is that you might find these radio opaque pills on the uh, radio opaque pills on X-ray. So that can also help you figure that out. You might, you might get an X-ray, you might see the pills. It may progress to anion gap metabolic acidosis. That's another important thing. Uh, Highlight this in the So you may see radio opaque pills, and you might see the metabolic uh, acidosis as a result. How do we treat it? You use chelation, the peroxamine, and the ferox, and the gastric lavage. Chronic is seen in patients who either have hereditary, hemochromatosis, or secondary, due to chronic blood transfusion, such as thalassemia and sickle cell. This is where you have iron built up all over the body. So you want to see symptoms all over in the brain, in the pituitary, in the pancreas, in the skin, in the heart, in the GI tract. Everywhere. It's going to precipitate and you're going to have symptoms in the bones, arthropathy, in the liver, cirrhosis, in the heart, cardiomyopathy, in the pancreas, diabetes, in the skin, skin pigmentation. Skin pigmentation, you're going to have bronze diabetes, and in the, in the gonads or the testes, you're going to have hypogonadism. Or that can be directly due to uh, pituitary uh, affection. Treatment is phlebotomy. Coagulation disorders. We said PT. Remember, PT, you are playing tennis, so that is extreme zero system. This is factor seven. And then you have PCT, which is intrinsic system, all the other stuff. PTT for 
intrinsic pathway, PT for extrinsic pathway. Hemophilia is an issue with factor eight, mostly if you just want to remember that. Factor eight, so factor eight is intrinsic system, correct? So PTT, uh, what is elevated? Then you're gonna have, uh, okay. Uh, the other types are either factor nine deficiency or factor 11 deficiency. Remember that it is X-linked recessive, so that means the mother is going to pass it on to her son. Hemorrhage and hemophilia. So, hemophilia, you have a coagulation defect. So, the hemorrhage is a lot, and it's deep. So, deep within the joints. So, you're going to have a heme arthrosis deep within the body, right? Bleeding after trauma or surgery or a dental procedure is very common in your clinical veneer to get a bleeding, a severe bleeding after a dental procedure. Severe bleeding after you've cut the umbilical cord. It's not the, the bleeding is not stopping. Severe bleeding after a very minor fall. Right? Treatment is desmopressin. What, what are we doing with desmopressin? Desmopressin increases von Willebrand factor. If you remember, von Willebrand factor is remember the big brother uh, for the little guy, which is factor eight. He protects him. So increasing the compression is going to protect whatever factor eight might be circulating, uh, or increasing that. So we have this compression, or we get them factor eight concentrate. Vitamin K deficiency. Remember, vitamin K deals with many things: two, seven, nine, and ten. So I'm dealing with uh, extrinsic, and I'm also dealing with intrinsic. So I'm going to have increased PT and increased PTT. Platelet disorders. Remember, we so said platelet bleeding is very superficial. So you're going to have increased bleeding time. That's important. So what do we have? Bernard Soulier, gland is and ITP. Bernard Soulier is GP1B. Glansman is GP2B3A. GP1B is you're going to have decreased platelet uh, and von Willebrand factor accumulation and abnormal retrocetin and large platelets. Remember, we said this a lot. You're going to have Increase bleeding time because these are all platelet disorders. The platelet disorder is increased bleeding time. Increased bleeding time. Increased bleeding time. Why might we have decreased PT? Uh, one second. So we have uh, uh, Bernard Soulier syndrome has increased bleeding time. So if I get a case of increased bleeding time and abnormal retrocetin assay and large platelets, we want to think of Bernard Soulier. If we have increased PT, but abnormal resuscitation, but I have increased with it, uh, increased um, uh, uh, intrinsic, so that's uh, PTT, but I'm dealing with von Willebrand. Why? Because von Willebrand carries factor 8, and factor 8 is part of the intrinsic system, and intrinsic system is PTT. So I have two diseases here. I really need to be aware of how I can differentiate between them on clinical event because the only thing I might be given is either to have large platelets or increased BT plus B, uh, PPT. So I need to be aware of that. Glansman thrombocytemia is autosomal receptive due to 2B3A deficiency. So decreased platelet to platelet aggregation and uh, defective platelet plug formation. Blood smear shows no platelets are formed. I2P is a diagnosis of exclusion. We studied this well for sub two or during our pediatric uh, rotation. We remember ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, you're going to have destruction of the platelets because they have anti 2 b 3 a antibodies. So the spleen starts to destroy the platelet on its own. Maybe idiopathic, most commonly, or secondary to autoimmune disorder like SLE or viral illnesses. You're going to have also very large platelets and the bone marrow biopsy. And decreased platelet counts. So large platelets on bone marrow biopsy. It's going to be ITP. And you've excluded everything else. Buzzwords for this is going to be uh, there is nothing wrong with the spleen. There's nothing paddle spleen on my body. And um, like I said, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. No, lymph, uh, no issues with the lymph nodes either. So uh, you want to exclude uh, malignancy from your differential. Treatment is steroids or splenectomy for refractory acne. Thrombotic microangiomas. I have two here: TCP and hemolytic uterus syndrome. What's going on? 
Even if you're usually female, you have an inhibition or deficiency of Adam CF13. So what's going on? I'm going to do this in a different color. You have a von Willebrand factor. It's actually not one thing. that we can lose. If I have a deficiency of this guy here, I have this gigantic molecule that's circulating, and it's going to trigger platelet adhesion everywhere. Okay? So I'll say that again. One millibram factor is a gigantic molecule. Okay? We need that atom, I'm just going to call it atom for short, atom TS13, uh, metallophobia, is to break this gigantic down into the small fragments that we can utilize when we need platelets to go into an area and make a clot. But when this doesn't happen, this gigantic molecule is now circulating in my circulation and it's going to trigger a mass platelet aggregation to occur, a fusion and aggregation to occur. So you're going to have increased platelet aggregation and aggregation. So microphone are occurring everywhere. Now remember what I said, if you have like a flumbi all over the place, right? And you have your and you have your red blood cells trying to circulate and pass through this now uh, very tight area, you're gonna have these sister sites that are also gonna appear every So what are you gonna find that is the same between these two patients? Microangiopathic can let you even decrease hemoglobin and increase tissue sites, increase algae and acute kidney injury. Because of the because of the probably seventy thousand okay. increased reaction. Let's say it's hundred. For TTP, the key thing is female and fever and neurological symptoms. Another thing to differentiate them between another condition called DIC is that they're gonna have normal PP and normal PTP. This is not an issue of the population cascade. There's an issue of PT and PTP are gonna be fine. It's gonna be normal. For hemolytic uremic syndrome, remember this is pus. Pus is in children. E. coli 015787 serotype. For this one, you're going to have similar symptoms. Uh, not symptoms, sorry. You're going to have uh, similar, they look similar in symptomatology, yes. But you're also going to have bloody diarrhea. You want a child who ate some hamburger. Uh, now they have bloody diarrhea. And now they have the, uh, these symptoms here. Uh, this one is supported here. The treatment for TTP is plasma screen. TTP is an emergency. So don't forget that Adam TS13 um, metalloprotease deficiency is what's causing this. This one is E. coli. Now we're going to get to the mixed platelet and coagulation disorders. So it's mixed, so I'm going to see issues with BT, PT, and PTP. Von Willebrand disease. Right? You have an issue with, remember, you have your collagen binding von Willebrand factor, and von Willebrand factor is going to bind to GP1B on the platelet, correct? So I have now a platelet issue, increased BT. The von Willebrand factor is also the big brother for factor 8. He protects him. So if he's not protected and gets destroyed, you're going to have an extrinsic defect, an intrinsic defect, sorry. So you're going to have increased PCT. So BT and PTT increase the von Willebrand disease. What are we going to see? Intrinsic pathway coagulation defect decrease von Willebrand factor, increase PTT because von Willebrand factor carries and protects factor 8. So you're going to have a defect in platelet plug formation. You're also going to have a defect in the coagulation cascade. It is autosomal dominant. It's very important. And it is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Most common inherited bleeding disorder. You're going to typically have a female with menorrhagia, increased heavy bleeding during menstruation. You're going to have no platelet aggregation appearing on resistant for factor SA. Remember to differentiate that from Bernard Soulier. We're going to have large, so you're not seeing any large platelets here. I'm confident now that it's one of the benefits. They also have increased PTT, which is normal with Bernard Soulier. Treatment is desmopressin. Desmopressin increases one uh, factor oh, and protects the factor 8, which releases one factor stored in endothelia. Remember, 
Von Willebrand Factory from some places. Platelets from the alpha granules, from the endothelium, from Weibel filet bodies. <laughs> Next is DIC. DIC is only one way to understand what's going on. We call it a consumptive. Okay, so recording. So you have now a consumptive coagulopathy. What is that? I trigger massive coagulation. So I've used up all of my coagulation factors and my platelets. So that means if I use up my platelets, I'm going to have increased heat. If I've used up my coagulation factors on both sides, intrinsic and intrinsic, you're going to have increased PP and increased PTP. So you have a widespread activation of clotting factor. I consume it, making clot. So I have increased in these numbers as well. It is very important about the cause of these uh, conditions of, of the IC. Snake bite, sepsis. Sepsis is very important. Again, if you have any questions on sepsis, somebody is uh, in the hospital, admitted to the hospital for a couple of days now, they're having bleeding and oozing out of the IV The IV trauma are such a complication. This is so high use for many, many reasons. Amniotic fluid embolism, pulmonary embolism. Amniotic fluid itself is very irritant and triggers the coagulation cascade. Then you have acute pancreatitis, malignancy, necrotic syndrome, and transfusion. So you're going to have elevated schistocytes because we have, again, everywhere you have clots. Everywhere you have clots, the RBCs are damaged as they try to pass through. The body attempts to break down these clots. You have increased fiber degradation, so it's increased design. I've used up my coagulation factor, so I have decreased fiber degradation, I have decreased factor, uh, factor 5, and decreased factor 8. Hereditary thrombophilia. So these are conditions where they're all uh, the and they're all to a hyper so you have antifarmacy deficiency. Okay, so my. Uh, how much do you have left? Okay, so my microphone is not working right now, so uh, it's going to be out of battery. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this video here. I think it is uh, one to go long enough to take our recording. Uh, I hope that you guys uh, learned anything and benefited through this. I know it's uh, taking a while. But we've left off at the hereditary thrombophilia, so I'll make another video starting off from there next time. And we can go through the rest, which is not so much. Uh, all we have left really is the uh, lymphomas and the leukemias and the drugs. So I'll definitely make a video about the rest of that. Uh, so for now, uh, I'm going to end the video here, and I hope that you guys learned. Uh, a lot, so it just kind of just help you go through the, the major parts of it. <laughs> and what is how you will be aware of. Um, so I will see you guys in the next video and take care. Bye.